So I'd like to officially ask that, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, we object. That's not in order. How is that not in order? It's just not in order. Time's expired. Chair, recognize Mr. Perry for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd just like to remind members of this committee and anybody watching that this is a duly constituted committee under the rules of the House of Representatives. Duly constituted. See Republicans on this side and Democrats on that side. The Democrats on that side were selected by their leadership and their process. Same thing for the Republicans on this side. Why do I mention that? Why do I bring that up? Because this is a stark difference from what is being referenced on the other side of the aisle. The so-called J6 committee, which was nothing more than a Soviet show trial in America. That's what that was. And so every single action that they took, subpoenaing people, disparaging people, referring charges of people, were not legitimate. Were not legitimate. So to compare what's happening today to what happened years ago is completely out of context. And you need to understand that. This is, this is a game for these folks. Sure, they want to support their guy. They don't care about America. They don't care about what the president's doing to destroy America. They're just locking horns, locking arms to support their guy. And God bless them. They can do that. If you want to vote for people that do that, that's your right. Now, in my opinion, this committee is not interested in prosecuting Hunter Biden. We're not interested in that. Hunter Biden is a sad tale by his own right, by his own admission, by leaving his evidence all around for everybody to see. The other side complains that documents and photographs are shown in this committee about Hunter Biden. Don't blame the person that showed the documents or the photographs. The person that committed the acts is the person who is responsible for the acts. And we do take no joy because it's a waste of time to prosecute Hunter Biden. But he created this for himself along with the rest of his sad tale of his life, unfortunate that it may be. But we, in this committee, on both sides of the aisle, on behalf of the American people, are charged with finding the facts. And the facts show that President Biden profited from his name, and the person that arranged the deals was Hunter Biden. And so we would like to delve into that. Now, Hunter Biden, regardless of his last name, even though he thinks he's special, he thinks he can leave evidence all around and blame it on the Russians when he knows it was him. He can go on TV and say that he thinks he's special because his last name's Biden and that no one will touch him. Ladies and gentlemen, the great thing about America is, is that we're all special because the law is blind to each one of us regardless of our station, our economic position, or our political position. Hunter Biden sadly chose to violate federal law. That's unfortunate. But we are duty bound to do something about it because without law we have anarchy. And that's what Hunter Biden would like. By coming here today, he shows that he can be here. He shows that he show, he displays that he could show up to a lawfully legitimately presented subpoena, but he chooses not to, and that's his choice. He can do that. But there are consequences for that, ladies and gentlemen. There are consequences for that. And we Will are duty yield? bound. Will the gentleman yield down here, Mr. Perry? I will not yield. We are duty bound. <clears throat> we are duty bound to pursue the consequences of that so that the American people can trust in the system of justice in the United States of America, which they do not right now. They don't trust in it, nor should they because this side of the aisle has made a mockery of it for the last three years and beyond that. Will, will the gentleman yield for I will not yield. Mr. Biden is not special. He was given a subpoena. He should have appeared. He chose not to. We have no choice. We have no choice if we are to uphold our oath to uphold and defend the Constitution of the United States. We have no choice except to refer charges and find Hunter Biden in contempt. His choice. That was his choice. Now we have to make our choice. And conflating the so-called, the so-called J6 committee, unduly authorized, not a committee, not a committee, no jurisdiction, no authority whatsoever under the law of anything 
to conflate that with these proceedings today is an abomination. My friends on the other side of the aisle know what they're doing, should be ashamed, should be embarrassed, but will not be. Regardless, we must forge on for the sake of this republic. I yield the balance. Gentlemen's time's expired. Chair now recognize Mr. Goldman for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I feel like I'm in Alice in Wonderland after that. Um, every American receives the same application of the law, and it does not matter what your last name is. So I guess that means if your last name is Perry, that subpoenas apply to you as well, lawful subpoenas. Now, I appreciate the gentleman from Pennsylvania's argument that the January 6th committee was not a duly constituted committee. And in fact, he and many others made that same argument to a number of courts of law. The courts are charged with interpreting our laws and whether a committee is a duly constituted committee and whether a subpoena is a duly constituted subpoena. And even though my friend from Pennsylvania may not like the fact that a neutral judge, multiple judges in fact, didn't agree with him, it still remains the law of the land, not what Mr. Perry says, not how I would interpret the January 6th committee, but how every single court of law interpreted it and said it was a validly constituted committee and every single subpoena issued by that committee was a duly authorized lawful subpoena, no different than the subpoena to Hunter Biden. Will the gentleman yield for a question? No, unfortunately, sir, you did not yield to me, so I will not yield to you. <laughs> the, the fact of the matter is that subpoenas should apply equally. And for my colleagues, to actually claim that we on this side of the aisle are hypocritical because we will not vote to hold someone who has made every effort to comply in every way other than the specific means of providing the evidence has is somehow should be held in contempt when three members of this committee refuse to comply in any way, shape, or form with a court-determined lawful subpoena is beyond me. Now, I find it interesting that my, my friend from Pennsylvania also chastises us for just supporting our guy. And I wonder what, how he would define supporting our guy. Would he define supporting our guy as trying to instigate a coup at the Department of Justice to install a lackey and remove the Attorney General and the Deputy Attorney General so that he could keep his guy in office even though he lost? Is, is that just supporting our guy? Because that's what Mr. Perry did. The reality is that we are here because, plain and simple, two reasons. Retribution for Donald Trump and the fact that the Republicans have no evidence. And you will hear them talk about evidence. You will hear them say, we have so much evidence, we have so much evidence. And we're gonna get into some of these details as we go forward. But the reality is that you have been moving the goalposts the entire time because you cannot make any connection notwithstanding all of your false statements to the president. So instead, let's subpoena Hunter Biden. Because what we will expect is that he won't testify or that he'll take the Fifth Amendment because he's under criminal indictment. And then we get to say, aha, all of our specious allegations must be true because if they weren't, he would come here and testify. Well, he called your bluff. And now you're scrambling. Will and the gentleman yield to the question? No, I will not. And now you're scrambling. You sure. And now you are desperate, desperate to find anything to divert attention away from your abject lack of evidence connecting President Biden to any business venture of Hunter Biden's to any wrongdoing. 
So we're going to hold us here on a contempt hearing because you don't want to see him testify in public. You just want to be able to filter his testimony and closed door testimony as you have been doing this entire Congress. Will the gentleman yield? I will yield to my ranking member. Thank you. Th thank you. Um, the district court for the District of Columbia, Judge Kelly, obliterated the argument that Mr. Time's expired. Chair recognizes Mr. I, I, Biggs for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. At the risk of taking the bait, which is what, which is all this is, it's laying a little little bait and, and might be just too attractive for me. So I got to get in on it, just maybe just a little bit. Uh, I'm, I'm intrigued by the assertions of my colleagues who claim that the Hunter Biden violation of the subpoena scenario is the same as issuing subpoenas to four members of Congress. I'm intrigued by that. I really am. It's interesting. Had the illegitimate J6 group decided to pursue to enforce its dubious subpoena against me, my counsel was prepared to argue that service of that subpoena was insufficient. And so asserted to counsel for the J6 committee. Had the illegitimate J6 gaggle sought to enforce its subpoenas, my counsel, and I believe the counsel of each member of Congress who had been subpoenaed, ostensibly subpoenaed, putatively subpoenaed, subpoenaed, would also have asserted successfully a privilege under the Constitution of the United States. Those questions never arose formally because the now defunct J6 committee, which has no authority anymore because it passed, it passed with the closing of the last session of Congress. I think that that cabal surely understood that its tenuous claims uh, uh, how tenuous his claims were and chose not to try and enforce his questionable subpoenas. And now, why do I say that? I say it because in reporting to Reuters, the committee's own chairman, Benny Thompson, said this, quote, there are some questions of whether we have the authority to compel testimony from Republican colleagues. He knew. He knew you didn't have that authority but yet you still try to assert it. Now, what's the distinction? Well, Hunter Biden has no claim to insufficiency of service of process. Why do we know? Because he stood on the lawn of the Senate the same day that he was supposed to be here and asserted publicly, hey, I'm supposed to be somewhere else. I'm supposed to be giving a deposition, but I won't do it. I won't do it. Secondly, Hunter Biden has claimed no privilege against testifying before this committee or the Judiciary Committee pursuant to the subpoena, except for the privilege that he has claimed throughout his life. And as the LA Times said about Hunter Biden, quote, Biden is still on the nepotism gravy train, close quote. As the Daily Mail reported, quote, Hunter admits he got $50,000 a month job on the board of Ukrainian gas company Burisma because of his family name, close quote. And it goes on and on. Again, the LA Times describes Hunter Biden as a, quote, child of privilege, close quote. That's the only privilege Hunter Biden has ever asserted. He asserts that not that he should be exempt from testifying because there is some constitutional proscription that even the chairman of this committee would agree to, as, as Benny Thompson agreed to, on the J6 committee's issuance of subpoenas to members of Congress. No, he doesn't assert that kind of privilege. He asserts only the privilege that he does not need to come and testify before the United States Congress, who has issued him subpoena. His attorneys acknowledge that subpoena, and he personally has acknowledged that subpoena for the simple reason that he is a Biden. So, where are we? Mayor Garland has authorized pursuing Republicans for contempt of Congress. He must auth also authorize pro prosecution of Hunter Biden. Failure to do so on the part of the Attorney General will show his contempt for Congress as well. But it will show even greater attempt, excuse me, greater contempt for the American people who now recognize the weaponization of the federal government and the two tier system promulgated by Democrats. 
Mr. Chairman, to Mr. Thompson, to former Chairman Thompson's uh, questioning of his own authority to actually issue subpoenas to members of Congress, Chairman Jordan requested legal analysis and authorities. But Chairman Thompson never responded. That committee could have pursued contempt if they thought there was valid subpoenas issued and a contemptible uh, a warrant, a warranted contempt citation. They chose not to. Their authority expired, and ours is not expired. We should issue contempt. I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Chair now recognizes Mr. Conley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, three names, Jordan, Perry, and Biggs, not a law firm, three members of this body who defied a legitimate, legitimately issued subpoena upheld by courts of law. I think it's really important to remember that when the word hypocrisy is thrown around by some of our friends on the other side of the aisle. The other thing I think that's really important before I yield to the ranking member Mr. Biden, Hunter Biden knows that if he appeared in camera, in, in secret, to be deposed, Republicans would cherry pick what he said and leak it. He preferred sunshine. He preferred to come here out in the open and testify before the entire American public, this body and everyone watching and take his chances with public testimony that could not be used to his detriment by cherry picking and distortion. That is and ought to be the right of an American citizen. I yield to the ranking member. Thank you kindly, Mr. Conley. Um, I wanted to uh, introduce for the record, Mr. Chairman, a United States District Court for the District of Columbia opinion uh, in RNC versus Nancy Pelosi, rendered by Judge Tim Kelly, uh, rejecting, obliterating, and demolishing every argument that we heard from uh, Mr. Perry and Mr. Biggs. Um, their whole argument seems to be that Republicans were entitled to blow off subpoenas of the United States Congress that came from the January 6th committee because they didn't like the committee, they didn't think it was legitimate, they thought it was uh, not validly authorized. The courts roundly and uniformly rejected those arguments. So now they purport to render the law for themselves. If they don't want to comply with the subpoena, they won't, and yet they would now hold uh, other witnesses like Hunter Biden to a standard they won't accept for themselves. Uh, that's a remarkable thing. I started off this hearing, Mr. Chairman, by saying we believe that everybody should respond in good faith to the subpoenas of the United States Congress. Now, Mr. Uh, Biden, uh, asserts that he responded in good faith to what you repeatedly publicly asked him to do. And he's at least got an arguable, colorable claim that that's true. All the case law I've been able to read, Mr. Chairman, suggests that the committee is supposed to engage in good faith negotiation with witnesses, which is precisely what the January 6th committee did. The dates don't always work out. The times don't always work out. Uh, some people want to assert a privilege. Some people don't. There are certain questions that are uh, agreed to or not. So there are negotiations. But as I read at the beginning of this Will hearing, the gentleman take a question? Uh, but I will as soon as I get to that. Uh, excuse me, it's my time. Oh. Mr. Raskin. Thank you, Mr. Conley. Uh, so um, uh, well, why is the committee not engaged in that negotiation with Hunter Biden? I, ju I just don't understand that. I mean, he's a guy who appears to be 99% willing to do uh, what you even asked him to do in the written uh, in the written subpoena, but he's given 100% uh, good faith compliance with what you repeatedly publicly challenged him to do. So I don't understand why you won't meet with them and work it out, which is what every court in the land has said. The courts don't want to be involved in all this stuff, especially when you've got a guy like him who's overwhelmingly complying with what you're asking for, unlike all of these um, uh, uh, colleagues on the other side of the aisle who unfortunately 100% defied the subpoenas of the United States Congress, which is what they did. And I don't think those people should be able to vote on any subpoena relating to any witness in this committee until they render cooperation with the January 6th committee and come forth and tell us what they know. Now, there's another point that I need to make, and I want to thank Mr. Connolly for his indulgence here. 
um, the, our good friend, the gentlelady from Georgia, uh, referred to the murder of Ashley Babbitt. Well, um, the Department of Justice, the United States Attorney, and the U.S. Capitol Police uh, Inspector General all rejected the idea that there was any point murder. of order, there Mr. Chairman, the, uh, or inquiry. Uh, there's no such thing. There's never been a court hearing. M Mr. Chairman, we agreed to uh, was how never to charged. Reclaiming order here. Uh, the time is Mr. Conley's. I yield back to Mr. Conley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, uh, but I will submit for the record uh, a document entitled Department of Justice Closes Investigation into the Death of Ashley Babbitt, United States Capitol Police document, USCP completes internal investigation into the January 6th officer involved shooting. I think it was a scandal. It was a tragedy that people died because Donald Trump put them at risk, as many of the former insurrectionists are now willing to say publicly, that he said you got to go and you got to fight and fight like hell or you will not have... Uh, right. You will not have uh, time, time's a democracy expired, anymore. Mr. Connolly's so, time's expired. I'm sorry Mr. Connolly's time has expired. Mr. Connolly's time has expired. Order, order. Uh, I was trying to reclaim I, the time the general lady stole from. Oh, well, we you. stopped the clock. I watched it. I'm I'm paying close attention. Uh, I do feel compelled to respond to this. We have engaged in good faith negotiations. We've offered every witness a narrow scope of topics, documents in advance. They can choose the date. Hunter Biden's lawyer has not engaged with the committee regarding Hunter Biden. Chair now recognizes did Mr. Did you Waltz, respond to their letter to offer to cooperate, sir? Mr. Chairman, did you respond to the lawyer's offer to uh, cooperate with the committee and meet with the committee? Do what? Yeah, chair, chair recognizes Mr. Waltz for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's, it's, this is an incredible first hearing with this yeah, welcome to the oversight committee <laughs> it was but you know I mean this was entirely predictable I think what we were going to hear uh, and and see today uh, we saw that that Hunter came uh, and staged a PR stunt with my friend uh, from Florida Mr. Moskowitz that was clearly uh, uh, organized and recognized but what I'm hearing from the raking member uh, and his colleagues that claim that transcripts are subject to, quote, partisan and twisted leaks and, and distortions is incredibly uh, rich. Let's talk about calling the, the kettle black first. Uh, the country suffered through an entire impeachment proceeding of a president of the United States because of a false dossier in a skiff, a compartmented facility where every hearing uh, and every transcript started with, this is an unclassified proceeding, uh, then to have it selectively leaked and lied to to the American people, to the great damage to this nation, but then bring it to this committee, because I'm new, I watched yesterday as committee Democrats continued to spall, spin uh, false narratives, several of which went out just yesterday as interviews were ongoing with Hunter Biden's art dealer, which is rich in and of itself, that Congressman Golden on the other side of the aisle went to the press during the interviews and spun a narrative while it was going on, but he conveniently admitted that 70% of the art buyers were Biden donors. So let's, we can, we can go down the line and talk That's about false, spin. Sir. That's not the uh, But the other thing that we're hearing today well, member so-and-so, Congressman so-and-so, Congressman Jordan, they didn't uh, comply with their subpoenas. But let's have a quick lesson on the Constitution. Article 1, Section 6 of the Constitution, the Speed and Debate Clause, essentially protects all of us from abiding by each other's subpoenas. Otherwise, this body would do nothing but subpoena uh, each other. So... I would encourage my colleagues to look up Article 1, Section 6, and look at the case law of the speech and debate clause and why my colleagues rightfully did not abide uh, by that subpoenas. But let's talk about precedent for a moment of a president's son abiding by lawful subpoenas of the Congress. Donald Trump Jr. came before this body. He came before the House Intelligence Committee, he came before the House Judiciary Committee, he came before the Senate Intelligence Committee twice, he came before the so-called Jan 6 Committee, all behind closed doors, 
where lawyers can sit down both sides of the aisle and have a conversation, go through documents all under oath, which is the precedent for any committee. Don Jr. came before committees and came before this body five times behind closed doors. What is Hunter Biden afraid of? What won't he do? And ranking member Raskin, you're going to reap what you sow, my friend. Uh, I mean, you insisted on depositions for those who've appeared before the Jan 6 committee when Steve Bannon agreed to testify publicly. You argued, sir, that he should have to sit for a closed door interview, just like every other witness. Quote, the way we have treated every single witness is the same. They come in behind closed doors. They talk to the committee there. You said on an interview in front of CBS in 2022, but now that Republicans are doing the same process, following House rules, doing the investigating, somehow Hunter Biden, because he's a Biden, should be held to a different standard. At the end of the day, we had a government official and the president of the United States, a vice president, set up 30 shell companies. Why? What product did those companies sell? Nothing. Vice President Biden was charged with two countries in his portfolio, China and Ukraine, while the vice president, his son, traveled on official business on Air Force Two and received massive monetary contributions afterwards. We have laws in place colleagues, that prevent foreign powers from influencing government officials. Were policies changed as a result of the dinners, the calls, the text messages that we know President Biden engaged in through his son? We have a duty to get to the bottom of it. We will reference this contempt, and we will see if the Attorney General will uphold a fair standard of the law. The time's up, Mr. Chairman. Yep. And prosecute Hunter uh, Biden. Thank you, Mr. Expired, Chair now recognizes Ms. Crockett for five minutes. Okay, all right. So we love the Constitution today. And we also want to talk about foreign money coming in. Have y'all seen the report that was just produced where this chairman decided that he was going to block this committee from receiving additional information about y'all's guy, Trump, and all the money that he took? From what we did receive, we know that Trump got almost $6 million that we can account for, and we know that, that's more, that there's more there. From China specifically, we found almost $8 million total that he accepted from foreign governments while he was serving as the president of these United States. But we're concerned about the president's son, the president's son who has not been involved in his administration. I just want to run it back, though, to the very beginning because this is something that I just can't get over. I can't get over the gentle lady from South Carolina talking about white privilege. It was a spit in the face, at least of mine as a black woman, for you to talk about what white privilege looks like, especially from that side of the aisle. And let me quote your now ousted speaker and what he had to say about the Republican Party and y'all's lack of diversity. When you look at the Democrats, they actually look like America. When I look at my party, we look like the most restrictive country club in America. So let me tell you something. Y'all don't know what white privilege looks like, but I'm going I'm to show you a little bit of something. You see, you want to talk about a two-tier justice system, and this is the only time that y'all have ever referenced it when this country has a history when it comes to black and brown folk of having two separate sets of rules. And right now what you want to do is have two separate sets of rules because Mr. Moskowitz offered y'all a fair situation. He said he would vote for Hunter to be held in contempt if y'all voted to hold all, even if you remove all of the members of Congress, there's still other people that y'all haven't decided that y'all have excuses for, but y'all don't want to hold them in contempt. But for some reason, it makes sense to hold Hunter Biden in contempt, who has tried to comply. And let me tell you why nobody wants to talk to y'all behind closed doors, because y'all lie. That's just the bottom line. You have done it thus far in this investigation. You have done it this far 
as it relates to this committee and every single hearing, y'all spin, spin, spin. I don't know how y'all are still standing right now because you should be quite dizzy from all the spinning that you're constantly doing when it comes to spinning the truth. You talk about free and fair elections, but you back a guy who we know tried to steal the election. And this isn't about what Democrats have to say. Let me remind you, for those of you that don't know how the justice system works, it's not a matter of the president went in and indicted Trump, but we are talking about grand juries. Grand juries are comprised of American citizens and the people that have entered pleas of guilty that will be flipping on your leader in a minute, they are Republicans. I do want to point that out. And half of them were Republicans that were handpicked by Donald Trump himself. So to be clear, whatever happens to your little leader, it's going to be because of the actions that he took. So you can talk all you want to about how January 6th was nonsense, but all of y'all were running at that time. Y'all were grabbing y'all's gas masks and y'all were running to your offices because you didn't know if they were coming to kill you. You should have cared that somebody was there to protect you, but instead you want to play games because you found out that it was your leader that decided that he wanted to propagate an insurrection on our country. So don't tell me that you care about the Constitution, because you don't. All you care about is Trump getting reelected, and I'll yield the last of my time to my leader. Thank you very much, Ms. Crockett, for your eloquent and powerful and irrefutable remarks. Uh, I'd like to just add a couple of points to what you've said. Uh, on January 6th, Senator Ted Cruz described it as terrorism. They later came to attack him during their revisionist, uh, Orwellian, Stalinist attempt to rewrite history. Unfortunately for them, we know that there were 147 or 48 of our officers who were wounded, bloodied, and hospitalized by the uh, rabid mob that beset the Capitol that day. We know that Kevin McCarthy, one of their deposed leaders over on their side, called Donald Trump from his office to complain about how his people were storming the Capitol and putting people's lives in danger. And Donald Trump said, no, no, those aren't my people, those are Antifa. And McCarthy corrected him and said, no, those are your people, Mr. President. To which Donald Trump said, well, maybe they just care a little bit more about who won the election than you did, Kevin McCarthy. You guys have got to deal with reality here. By the way, the speech and debate clause stands for the exact opposite principle who our distinguished new member uh, uh, th just spoke about a moment ago. It says that members that members of Congress Mr. cannot Chairman, be questioned Mr. anywhere Chairman. else other than Congress. So Point he should privilege. read the speech or debate Mr. clause Chairman. aloud. Uh, let, 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 him, let him finish his sentence there. Now, Chair recognizes Mr. Burchett Mr. from Tennessee Chairman. for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, my colleagues seem to want to talk about the justice system, so let's talk about it. November of last year, the chairman issued a subpoena to Hunter Biden to appear on December 7th, uh, December 13th, excuse me, for a closed door deposition. Instead of respecting the rule of law, Hunter Biden chose to give a press conference on the front steps of the Senate. To, so, to, to show such contempt for Congress without fear of repercussions highlights a theme throughout this administration and Democrat administrations before it. If you're a big name Democrat, then you're immune to prosecution. Former Attorney General Eric Holder said as much in a memo he wrote regarding collateral consequences. For those who don't know, the collateral consequence policy allowed prosecutors to consider whether charging a company or individual will result in greater societal harm than not charging them. It's why the banks weren't held criminally accountable to the fallout of the 2008 financial crisis. It is why Jeffrey Epstein's clients aren't behind bars. It's also the mindset of President Biden and his family, too big to jail. Not too big to fail, too big to jail. The two-tier justice system is a disgrace to our country and the principles it was founded on. I thank the chairman and the committee for the hard work they put in to hold the Biden administration accountable, but I doubt our Justice Department has the guts or the wherewithal to do anything about it. And I would like to yield my time to my friend from Florida, Byron Donalds. Actually, I, actually I'll yield. Yeah, yeah, let, me, let me yield to Miss May. She hasn't gotten enough quality well, TV time no. today, so I'll give her a little more time. Uh, thank you, and then I'll yield to my colleague from Florida. So I'm going to try to be quick here because I was accused by my colleague on the other side of the aisle about my white privilege. I want to say, number one, as a former ranking member of the Civil Rights Subcommittee under Chairman Raskin last session, I take great pride as a white female Republican to address the inadequacies in our country. I come from a district where rich and poor is literally 
black and white, black versus white on most days. My largest jail in my district, which is the largest jail in the, sa jail in the state of South Carolina, has had seven or eight deaths in the last two years. And I was there with our black and African-American council members trying to get the right thing done. And I come from a district where black men have been killed by law enforcement, tased to death in our jails. And I've stood with those black families because I know the differences that they see day to day in their life. And I try to do the best that I can. I come from a district where the first African-American, first black man in the U.S. House of Representatives was Joseph P. Rainey, represented my district back in the 1800s with that. The last black member of the U.S. House of Representatives before Reconstruction came from South Carolina, George P. Murray. The, the, the black man, former slave, an entrepreneur who founded the Republican Party in South Carolina, one of the founding members was named Robert Smalls, who commandeered a, a Confederate ship and gave it to Union soldiers and served his country admirably in the process. In my district, it was Harriet Tubman, and you can see it in the movie, movie Harriet, who rescued more than 700 slaves in one night in Beaufort County, South Carolina. So I am very well aware of our rich history and try to recognize it as best as I can in the position that I have. And I resent the fact that you're gonna throw that in my face up here. I'm one of the few people that you'll see on my side of the aisle trying to do the right thing to the right people every single day. And I would like to yield the remaining uh, balance of time to my colleague from Florida. Uh, this has been a very interesting hearing. Mr. Waltz, welcome to Oversight. Yes, it usually gets like this. Uh, look, let's be very clear. This isn't about Hunter Biden's white privilege. It's about Hunter Biden's Democrat privilege because Donald Trump Jr. showed up for five congressional subpoenas. There was never this circus where he was subpoenaed by House Democrats and he showed up on the Senate side or showed up at the White House to answer in some fake, phony, lame press conference, not actually going to the House and doing what he was compelled by a subpoena to do. Hunter Biden did that. And then he has the unmitigated gall to show up here when we know that he's, we're going through actually the, the legislation for contempt with, by the way, Mr. Chairman, we should actually get to the legislation of contempt. The speechifying is great, but let's do our business members. Um, he has the gall to come here, show up, and then when the Democrats are saying, hey, he wants to speak, he leaves. This is a joke. This is a farce. The man has been subpoenaed by Congress. Oh, and by the way, the January 6th committee, Mr. Raskin, which you did sit on, by the way, that was not a normally ordered committee of Congress because Nancy Pelosi did not want the Republican members that's, that then Leader McCarthy put up. According to the courts, it was. I spent my time, sir. Will you fine. yield for I, a, no, I will a not. correction? I was respectful of your time. I didn't say anything. So, ladies and gentlemen, let's move forward with our business. He should be held in contempt. There was a subpoena. He did not answer it. Any other American will be held in contempt by Congress. Any other. This is Democrat privilege of the highest order. Let's do our jobs. I yield. Gentlemen, yield. Chair now recognize Ms. Ocasio-Cortez from New York. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, just to address briefly, um, quickly, that, that moment about uh, privilege and, and all of this that we're seeing here. Uh, it was a very beautiful speech uh, by the gentlelady um, who, as she mentioned, was uh, helped lead on the majority, the now majority side, uh, the Civil Rights and Civil Liberties Subcommittee. But I think it's so exemplary of the point that she also oversaw the elimination of the Civil Rights Subcommittee on this committee, which really kind of gives the whole game away. We show up, we give speeches, we give flowery words, but at the end of the day, participate in the structural erosion of the rights and representation of people uh, that, that are marginalized, women, people of color, people that just need to see their due process and civil liberties protected in this country. But I will move on. As also the Republican side had mentioned in their many uh, raisings of the January 6th committee, that it's not just Hunter Biden, you, me, any individual subject uh, to, to equal treatment under the law, to be held up to accountability under the law, but it is also these committees and this committee that is subject to oversight and law. We must comply with the law here as well. Now, I may be one of the very few people that actually believes in Congress, you know, in this country. But I do, and many of us do here. And we have an obligation to engage in good faith participation to execute and comply with a subpoena. The chairman said in front of the country several times to Hunter Biden, you can show up here in front 
of the world in front of the public. Hunter Biden took him up on that offer. He said, I will show up in public. I will show up in public. He showed up here today. He showed up here in the past. And Mr. Chairman, I know you do your best with what you've got, but you've got members here that have submitted falsified evidence to the record. You have members here that have submitted and mischaracterized closed door hearings. And people want to say back and forth at the end of the day, it doesn't matter what party it's happened from. You've got members who've engaged in revenge porn in this committee. So it is understandable why Hunter Biden would want to testify in front of the public for the American people to be able to witness that testimony uh, it, for themselves. You've got members who've defied subpoenas. You've got members who we are um, one year into the term asking what the rules are at the beginning of the committee. The book was given to us on day one. And so what we should do is allow the man to testify. I believe in the power of the oversight committee. Frankly, I believe in it regardless of whether Republicans or Democrats have the chair, because I believe that this committee should have the power of oversight. And we cannot do that on a partisan basis. And so for that, I implore this committee to allow Hunter Biden to testify publicly. I implore and I ask for that to happen. And we cannot do that by getting engaged in this back and forth on a, on a defiance of a subpoena. Let him comply. Let him do it today. Let him do it tomorrow. But let the man do it. And with that, I yield back to the ranking member. Thank you, Ms. Ocasio-Cortez. I think you went right to the heart of the issue here. Um, you know, if this ended up going to court, Mr. Chairman, and I hope it doesn't, I really hope that this committee will act in a way to negotiate and, and uh, achieve a compromise with the witness. But if it goes to the court, it's going to present a novel question. What happens when a committee represented by its distinguished chairman goes out in public and repeatedly invites and challenges a witness to come before the committee, and then that witness gives the answer, yes, I will come in. At that point, the committee pulls a bait and switch and says, well, we actually don't want you to come before the full committee as was offered repeatedly in public by the chairman, but instead we'd like you to come to a back room and do it there in a closed deposition. Now, undoubtedly, if that had been the original offer, the committee would stand in a very good place, the way we did with Mr. Biggs and Mr. Perry and Mr. Jordan, because they were told to come in, they were subpoenaed, and they blew off the subpoenas uh, of the committee, which is why I don't think anybody should be voting on that side other than Ms. Mace, because Ms. Mace is the one who took the position that the rule of law means something. And I take the position, if we give somebody a subpoena, they should come in. But there's a very, there's a very sticky problem now. What happens when we give them one offer A and then switch it over to offer B? That's why I hope you will work it out, Mr. Chairman. Thank and, you for and, yielding. Uh, gentlelady's time's expired. Uh, to respond to the gentlelady, he can come in for a hearing after the deposition. Chair now recognizes Ms. McLean for five so, minutes. So I, I just want to bring everything back home. This hearing is a contempt of Congress hearing for Hunter Biden. It's not about January 6th. It's not about Mr. Perry. It's not about white privilege. It's a contempt of Congress hearing about Hunter Biden. Although I appreciate the diversion tactics, like my colleague from Florida said, let's get back to our business, which is actually the contempt of Congress. I also want to thank my colleague, um, uh, Ms. Uh, 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 Cortez. Um, I, I agree. Let him comply, right? Let him comply. And with our ranking member, let's follow the rule of law. So in contrast, let me read the rules of the committee real quickly. It's on page nine of the rule book, right? And it talks about notices. Notices for the taking of depositions shall specify the date, the time and the place of examination. Depositions may continue from day to day. Then you go to section D, consultation with the ranking minority member of the committee shall include, listen for it, listen for it, three calendar days notice. So although I'm sure any defendant would like to come in 
and say, judge, I want to come in on this day, and the defendant is going to tell the judge and the legal system how the trial is going to run. Unfortunately, that's not how it works. It's really simple. So I do agree with you. Let him comply. Let him comply with the subpoena that we gave him. He chose not to. So therefore, we are holding Hunter Biden in contempt of Congress. And I would also like to say, you had the opportunity when you all were in charge, or y'all were in charge, to do the same with the members on our side of the aisle. You didn't do that. That's not our fault. That's yours. So we're here to talk about Hunter Biden. For everyone watching today, and for my colleagues on the other side of the aisle, I want to be clear again what this hearing is really about. Hunter Biden was subpoenaed to answer Congress, right? That's it. Questions. But, but he violated federal law by failing to appear before the committee. You can't spin that for my colleague on the other side of the aisle. You can't spin that. The bottom line is Hunter did not show up and he committed a crime. You see, we are a land of laws and we must follow those laws. And that's what we're here to do today. Instead, he was on the grounds of the US Capitol where he made a public statement without taking questions from the media, conveniently. So instead of showing up for his legal obligation, he showed up just steps away from a hearing room to spit in the face of this Congress. And unfortunately, that is Hunter Biden's MO. We're merely doing our job. What we're doing here today is showing the country that Hunter will not receive special treatment due to his last name. It's very, very simple. And he will be held to the same standard that every other American citizen would be, hand, would, would be uh, expected to do. Can you imagine if your average America and you get a subpoena, and you go in and tell the judge, hey, let me tell you, here's how it's going to work, judge. I'm not showing up. I'm not showing up. I'm going to do it my way. I know we have laws, but eh, don't worry about those laws because uh, that would never fly. But that's exactly what Hunter Biden's doing. And if we care about this institution, if we care about democracy, at some point in time, we have to hold the law and people who break the law accountable. Or like my colleague said, we are going to have anarchy. So simply put, it's not about anything else. We're talking about Hunter Biden and his non-compliance. And you can get up and scream and holler and rant and rave and talk about everything but the fact we subpoenaed Congress legally Hunter Biden, and he show, chose not to show up. Read the rules. He has to follow the law. I know that's a very um, foreign concept, but you have to do it. And for the Biden family, you too have to follow the laws. And with that, I yield back. Gentlelady yields back. A quick parliamentary inquiry, Mr. Chairman. Yes. Um, the gentlelady makes an excellent point about the three-day notice requirement for subpoenas. I don't think that's ever been complied with um, in this committee. Will you commit to... That's not, that's not uh, my issue. I'm just reading no, the laws. No, it's my time, Mrs. McLean. Thank you so much. Um, but would you commit to honor the three-day notice requirement that Mrs. McLean properly invoked? What, what I comply we, look, I, I'll say this to answer the ranking member's question, yeah. then I'll recognize Ms. Tenberry. We have complied with the three. And you, okay, well, we might have a dispute about that, but what you will I would continue ask this will going you forward. You will we, continue will you going forward. We have, we have followed That's the my rules. Question. Will you we don't comply? have the chair, Mrs. McLean, and you don't have the time. We have followed the rules. This is. I mean, it's chair now recognizes Ms. Stansbury. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, it's always a wild and interesting adventure here in the Oversight Committee, and this morning certainly doesn't disappoint. Um, you know, I want to talk for a few moments about the resolution that's been proposed in the ANS here, because that's what we're here to debate this morning. And really the content of that, including the assertions about the investigation that led to the moment that we're at here today. But I am really glad that my colleague mentioned that we are a land of laws and that every citizen should have to comply with them, including members of this committee, not to mention a chairman, 
who was subpoenaed during the last Congress and refused to respond. So if we're going to apply these laws, then they must apply equally, I would think, to even members of this committee. And certainly to the front runner in the GOP's presidential election, which I'll get to in a moment. But let's talk a little bit about this ANS and about the background and correct the record a little bit. First of all, I want to talk about the evidence that was presented to this committee as part of this investigation. More than 62 thousand pages of records from the National Archives on top of 20,000 pages that were already made publicly available, 30,000 pages of private bank records, 2,000 pages of activity reports provided by the Treasury Department, dozens of hours of testimony from special counsel, U.S. attorneys, DOJ officials, FBI, IRS agents, financial advisors, friends, business partners, evidence provided by the Ways and Means Committee, and expert witness testimony by the GOP's own witnesses right here in this committee in September who sat right there at that table and said there was not sufficient evidence to support proceeding with an impeachment. In fact, there are numerous members of the GOP currently serving in Congress who do not believe there is sufficient evidence. So my question is, where are the receipts? You have reviewed thousands of pages of documents, countless hours of testimony, talked to expert witnesses, including your own witnesses, that can't provide a single iota of evidence of wrongdoing by this president. But last week, House Democrats released this. We have the receipts. In fact, they're all right here in the Mazars report. And for any of you that have not dug in on this report, I want to talk a little bit about what this report shows. Because it's actual receipts from foreign governments who spent $7.8 million at Trump properties during his presidency while they were actively seeking to influence foreign policy and decisions by the administration. Will the gentlelady yield so, to the question? Let's talk about some of the receipts that are in here. Oh. Malaysia, over a quarter million dollars was spent by representatives of Malaysia while their ex-president was being investigated for a massive corruption scheme and which Trump's ex-fundraiser was indicted for illegally lobbying on. Saudi Arabia, tens of thousands of dollars spent by the Saudi government and by the crown prince and his staff the who will question. later give $2 billion to Jared Kushner's private firm. Qatar, tens of thousands of dollars spent by Qatar during what was described as a charm offens offensive and an arms sale to the government of Qatar by the Trump administration. Kazakhstan, thousands of dollars spent by the president of Kazakhstan on a controversial visit which raised questions about human rights violations, business dealings, and a money laundering scheme involving Donald Trump's properties in New York. So my question is, if the GOP actually cares about criminal activity, how about they investigate the receipts that we have right here? The Can I answer that question? of influence peddling by Donald Trump and a man who is currently facing trial in four jurisdictions on 91 counts of criminal activity who's been twice impeached by this body and is currently trying to run for president again. And I would love to answer your question. of this committee has already endorsed. This is not factually based. This is a farce. This is a political stunt, and it is designed to help Donald Trump secure the nomination this November. We yield to a question. So let's call it what it is. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield my time back to the chair. Four seconds. Four seconds. Three, two. All right. Well, Time's expired. Mr. Chairman, I, I ask unanimous, con unanimous consent to enter information for the record. What's the information? Oh, okay. uh, I state the information. Thank you. I reserve the right to object. The, the minority has not provided a copy of the material for the record. In the past, she's displayed pornography. Is pornography allowed to be, or pornographic photos allowed to be displayed in this committee room, Mr. Chairman? It's not pornography. Okay, well, you're the expert. I'll wrote, I'm, I'm not an expert, Mr. Seems Raskin. Seems like it. 
Mr. Uh, Chairman, this, I object uh, to the this unanimous. Is, uh, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman. Uh, hold, 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 all you need I is object. one objection. We need decorum. We're gonna. I'm gonna let the lady state, and then if you object, still we'll go from there. Mr. Chairman, don't we have the opportunity to review the material before? I reclaim my time. I reclaim my time. time. Mr. Chair, I reclaim my time. I'd like to enter for the record an excerpt from uh, a bank statement. Look, there, there's a bank, a bank statement that's Mr. public Chairman. in regards Jack, to Mr. Hunter Biden Mr. and his bank accounts. Objected. In his payments, Mr. For Chairman, I object okay. to the styrofoam Chair. board. It's not a I, document. Reclaiming order, reclaiming order, reclaiming order. We'll clearly Democrats today don't want the truth to come out. I mean, Mr. Chairman, but this but just I, means that any like member will be able to add to their five minutes by putting on a display of. Mr. Placard. Chairman, I'd like to enter for I mean, the record. I think as Mr. Chairman, I from a, I a bank report. That shows Can proof we get some order here? Mr. Biden Chairman, we, we, where are we in the human All right, economy? Okay, okay. We'll, let's hold off on this. There's several objections. We're going to talk staffs between each other, and then we'll, we'll go from there. But I understand, I think what you're saying is from the laptop. Uh, someone on this committee accused me of revenge porn, and I have a right to respond to that, and I'd like to enter. We're within the rules of the committee, no, everyone. For Mr. The Chairman. Record. This, is, this is important evidence for the record, uh, and it, it, it pertains to our investigation into, into Joe Biden and, and Hunter Biden, and this comes so from. So do it behind closed it, doors like you do it. It doesn't appear to be bad, but you ought to. But the, Mr. Chairman, she's got nine the factors there. Does she get an additional five but minutes or ten minutes? I, I don't understand how any of you has, okay. who support the well, genital mutilation order? Okay, of okay, okay. children we're gonna and drag queens we're gonna, showing we're gonna, their body we're gonna parts and parades order here. We're gonna, we'll suspend and let the staff discuss the evidence from the, the laptop being entered into the record. Uh, Chair now recognize Mr. Fallon from Texas. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, so oh, oh, okay, hold on, hold on. The, we suspend, so we need to stop for a moment. Okay, hold on. We'll get this. Y'all going to discuss? You want to go?
So we're going to move on. We're going to we're going to call on Fallon now. Okay. All right. Reconvene. Chair now recognizes Mr. Fallon from Texas for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. You know, you have to acknowledge that this, there's a concentrated effort to deflect and distract, and this is not about January 6th, and unfortunately for the Democrats, it's not about Donald Trump. This is about Biden family corruption, plain and simple. And what really gets me is from just an individual and from an American to being an American is the fact that I disagree vehemently with most of the, our friends across the aisle uh, when it comes to politics. I will submit that most folks that serve in Congress, whether they're Democrats or Republicans, are not corrupt. They're not on the make. They're not trying to enrich themselves. Hunter Biden is. The Biden family was. And so to sit here and defend a fella that doesn't merit that kind of defense is just interesting. And quite frankly, I find it sad as well. And I think he's a coward to come in here with this stunt again, because you know, you can define someone that's all about themselves by the way in which they act, and he clearly does that. That's what we're here to discuss. So let's talk about the process, because we've been told that, hey, he was here, he's ready to testify, just let him testify. For the American people, to make it very clear and digestible, when you are deposed in Congress, the majority gets an hour and the minority gets an hour, and it can go on indefinitely. So what, it usually, what usually happens is you can get 100 hours of questions in. You can go drill down. You can get into the efficacy of the procedure because you can go in-depth, and you can hold whoever is the witness to account. If we have just public testimony, what happens here is we all get five minutes. Time is roughly about 60 equals 300. Doing the math without a calculator, that's five hours. So instead of hundreds of hours, you only get five. And witnesses are very good with their counsel to deflect and distract and answer really slowly, et cetera. That's why this is about procedure. 100 hours, 200 hours, and then we can come in to public testimony and ask questions about what we have read and make that public. So what I would have loved to, he was here, he left, unfortunately, because I would have loved to at least ask questions while he's in the room for the first time. I've never laid out naked eyes on the man until just now. But I would have loved to have asked certain questions like, why did he feel special that he could evade paying uh, taxes on millions of dollars of income? Why, um, why doesn't he pay it back? I know a lot of it is already outside of the statute of limitations, so he can't be prosecuted for it, but he can certainly still pay it back. That's a moral obligation that any American has. I'd like to ask him what he did, his company did, to earn 3.5, earn in quotes, $3.5 million from Yelena Batarina, who was married to a corrupt oligarch who used to be the mayor of Moscow. What did he do to have Kenish Rajakev from Kazakhstan give, wire him $142,300 the very next day he bought a Porsche? What did he do for Mr. Rajakev? What did he do? Did he get bribed, naked bribe, $5 million by Mykola Zolchevsky? And did he have any experience in the energy sector prior to his, fr his father becoming vice president because Zolchevsky paid him a million dollars a year? Interestingly enough, the CFO of Burisma, Vedan Pazarsky, had dinner after he paid Hunter Biden millions of dollars, had dinner with his then sitting vice president dad at Cafe Milano. Did that happen? Because it seems like it did. Did Kenesh Rajakev, who gave him, but essentially bought him the Porsche, he also had dinner with his dad. And yes, coincidentally, Yelena Batarina as well had dinner with his sitting vice president father at the time. Who I would also like to have asked him, having been an entrepreneur and business person myself, why create 30 shell companies if you have a legitimate business? What did your business do? What services did they provide? What goods did they sell? Um, who pockets seed money? I have never met anybody in business that pocketed seed money. It's the lifeblood of your venture. Why did you take millions from foreign entities? And what did, who was the big guy? Mr. Hunter Biden, was it your dad? 10% for the big guy. When you said in that WhatsApp message that I'm sitting right here with my father, was your father really there? Will you give up your geolocations on your phone with your dad so we can determine if you guys were actually in the same room at that time? Why did you email your daughter or text her and ask, uh, tell her about, boy, I wish I didn't have to give 50% of my salary to dad? This all is just questions that under a deposition, when we have hundreds of hours, we could ask this. 
and I'm only one member of a committee of 60. I'm sure my colleagues would have plenty of questions as well. So this is what it's about. It's about justice. And think about who you're defending here. He's not worthy of your defense. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Gentleman yields. The chair recognizes Mr. Lynch for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I will agree with my friend and colleague, the gentleman from Texas, that this is a sad day, but uh, perhaps sad for different reasons. This, this whole process has become such a sham. The underlying purpose at the beginning of these hearings was that, um, as, as was the title of the one of the first hearings we had, a hearing on the basis for an impeachment inquiry against President Joseph R. Biden. And at that hearing, the Republicans and the Democrats had an opportunity to bring witnesses forward that would actually provide evidence to the committee so that we could make a decision to substantiate or, or, or to undermine the, the call for an impeachment. And we sat in this hearing, and the Republicans brought their witnesses in. And, and, I, and I have to admit, witnesses that had considerable experience and expertise and, and impressive resumes. And so we asked them. So this is the big moment. We asked these witnesses that the Republicans had brought in, are there any basis or, or underpinnings that would warrant an impeachment inquiry at this point. And these witnesses had reviewed almost all of the 14,000 documents that had been provided, transaction reports, uh, treasury reports, and I'll give you the answers. These are the Republican witnesses. This is uh, Jonathan Turley and uh, I think Bruce Dubinsky was a consultant. One witness said, and I quote him, he did not believe that any of the current evidence would support articles of an impeachment, close quote. That's the Republican witness that you had your moment. You had your moment to would, bring would, in the witnesses. Would the gentleman gonna, yield? No, I will not yield. I will not yield. The other witness that the Republicans brought forward against President Biden. He said under questioning, he had no basis to even suggest that, was that there was corruption, fraud, or any wrongdoing on the part of the president. Now, I, I do, I, we are all familiar with Hunter Biden's, uh, his conduct. There have been explanations of his drug addiction that have been widely publicized, something that maybe a few families of members of this committee might be familiar with, when people go sideways because they're, they're addicted to drugs. But the very moment to, to pursue the, the underlying purpose of these hearings has been completely diverted. There's been no evidence brought forward against the President of the United States. And as to this witness coming here today or his reluctance to, to submit himself to private investigations can be, I think, credibly explained given the lack of trust that has surrounded these hearings. There have been story after story about leaks coming from those private interviews. Blatant misinformation and disinformation that the chairman and other members of the committee have offered to the press. So-called bombshells, that's what it was on Fox TV, bombshells turned out to be a dud, turned out to be completely false. But, but under the auspices of this committee, those members, including the chairman, put out these stories in the press because they could not be refuted. 
They were not subject to cross-examination. They were not provided for or provided by any credible witness that was just made up in the minds of the chairman of, of those members. That's why this gentleman wanted to testify in public so someone could not distort uh, his statements and leak them wrongfully to the press. The chairman- Chair, Chair now recognizes Ms. Luna for five minutes. This contempt proceeding is about upholding the rule of law. You know, with recently what happened with Jeffrey, Jeffrey Epstein and the client list, we can see that many rich and powerful people, to include people in Washington, um, were held above the law, and that is simply not fair. Um, and interestingly enough, though, one of the victims of Jeffrey Epstein, Virginia Guffrey, actually vindicated Trump. Uh, what you'll notice is that the media did not want to cover that, but why is that? It's because it will show a double standard that exists within our justice system and also the media bias against those, especially Republicans and conservatives, that are simply not guilty of what they are accusing us of. So I just want to put this in perspective. The reason we are doing this today is because Hunter Biden failed to comply with our subpoena. Hunter Biden, I don't care about his drug addiction. Yes, you are. Many of us have experienced some of these awful things impacting our family, but that doesn't mean that Hunter Biden gets a pass or that we should feel any sympathy for him breaking the law. Um, I want to just point to behind me, U.S. Code 192, refusing of, a refusal of a witness to testify or produce papers. It means that you should be, one, subject to a misdemeanor, a fine up to $1,000, and anywhere from one to 12 months in prison. For your average American that doesn't have the connections that Hunter Biden has, this is what you face. So I want to just point out that when my colleague, Representative um, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, says we must comply with the law, I agree with you. When a ranking member Raskin pointed out that, uh, represent, or that Donald Trump's allies should be held and we should not tolerate these contemptuous violations of the rule of law, I agree with that. But then let's use these exact same standards against their own. Frankly, I think that as of right now, there is a double standard that exists. We have to hold him accountable. He broke the law. He will be held accountable. And that's exactly why I'm supporting this contempt proceeding. Thank you. Okay. Chair now recognizes Ms. Tlaib for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm going to yield to our ranking member. But before I do, I just, you know, after coming back and being in our districts for so long, no one is asking me about this. They're, they can't pay their bills. There is a lot of cost of living struggle all over our districts. And I just wish we would use this committee to talk about those issues. I mean, even on having the Sadler uh, folks in here and talking about that, the cost of insulin. I mean, Mr. Chair, I, I would love to work with you in a bipartisan way to talk about those issues that I think really there's responsibility all over the place in regards to the fact that so many of our American uh, residents and, and communities across the country are struggling. Uh, with that, I yield uh, to our ranking member, Raskin. Thank you, Ms. Tlaib, for your tremendous and enduring devotion to your constituents and the public good of all Americans. Um, why are we here, colleagues? Well, between January of 2017 and January of 2021, uh, we suffered the most lawless presidency of our lifetime. It began by Donald Trump saying that he would keep his more than 500 businesses going. That's right, and he wouldn't divest himself of any of those businesses, and he would not adopt a rule in honor of the Emoluments Clause, consistent with the Emoluments Clause, declining to take money from Saudi Arabia, China, United Arab Emirates, and so on. And then he proceeded, as we've learned, <clears throat> to collect at least $7.8 million from foreign governments, and that's actually a tiny fraction of what he got because that was only for the first two years before uh, the chairman in his wisdom decided to tell Mazars to stop complying with a judicial court order. And so we, that was all we got was two years for four businesses out of more than 500. And that was just for 20 countries out of 195 countries on earth. But the lawlessness lasted up until yesterday when Donald Trump's lawyer got up before the DC Circuit Court of Appeals and asserted that President Trump, or any other president for that matter, has a right to order assassinations of his political opponents and not be prosecuted for it unless he's impeached and convicted first, which is completely at odds with the text of the Constitution, the history of the Constitution, but he asserted a right to assassinate other citizens unless first he's 
impeached or convicted, which means all you got to do is kill your political opponents and then kill enough of your political opponents in the House and Senate to keep yourself from being impeached or convicted. My friends, please don't look at your phones and papers right now. This goes to the heart of the republic. Take a position on it, even if you're going to support it. Take a position on it. Don't stick your heads in the sand. Donald Trump is doing this to our country. He's asserting the right of the president to murder people and not be prosecuted for it. Well, so why are we here? Well, Donald Trump insisted to numerous Republicans and in public and on Twitter and on Truth Social that Joe Biden be impeached. Why? Well, because Donald Trump was impeached twice, the last time for inciting a violent insurrection against his own vice president, against the Congress of the United States to overthrow an election. <clears throat> and if you don't believe that, you've got to tell me that if Mike Pence had buckled under two weeks and months of pressure, that Donald Trump would have said, oh no, I was just kidding. I'm not actually going to seize the presidency. Come on, if you believe that, you're too innocent to be let out of the House by yourself. So anyway, Donald Trump says, I don't want to be the only one running for president who's been impeached. Impeach Joe Biden. Figure out something. We were here for a year. You guys did not lay a glove on Joe Biden. You don't have a single credible piece of evidence, not one iota, showing any crime by Joe Biden. As Mr. Lynch says, uh, even your own witnesses came up and said they didn't see it at the one hearing that you had on impeachment. So why are we here? Well, we can't go after Joe Biden. He's clean. Let's go after Hunter Biden. Let's go get him. And that's why I'm so suspicious of where we are today, Mr. Chairman, because I heard you numerous times say, come before the committee. Come and testify before the world. Come and tell everybody what happened. And he took you up on it. And he said, yes. And I said, finally, we'll get to hear from Hunter Biden. We'll get to answer, uh, hear answers to all those questions Mr. Fallon posed. But then you wouldn't take yes for an answer. You said, no, we want to go to a back room and do it there, and then we will leak out uh, you know, appropriate details, which of course we have seen has allowed for radical distortions of people's testimony before this uh, committee. You have not released the vast majority of transcribed interviews that have been in the back room so we can leak out specific details. So that's not right. That's why we have questions about it, but I'm with Ms. Mace. Let's bring them all in. Let's bring in all the Republicans who still haven't testified about what they know about what I'm on January 6th, and let's bring Hunter Biden, and let's do that all together. I, I'd be for that. And thank you for yielding, Mr. Lieb, and I yield back. Chair recognizes Mr. Langworthy for five minutes. Well, we've certainly had enough distractions here today, and in, in the political stunt that we saw here at the beginning of this hearing, uh, you know, Hunter Biden strutting in here like a real tough guy while he refused to sit for a deposition that he'd been lawfully subpoenaed to do. It must be embarrassing to have to defend all of this. And we, we certainly have Trump derangement syndrome on display in a big way in this chamber today. Over the last year, the Oversight Committee has uncovered a plethora of evidence that is directly pointing at the corruption from Joe Biden and his family. This level of corruption is what you'd expect to see in a third world country, not the United States of America. If the volume of evidence was uncovered on any other influential family in the United States, my colleagues on the other side of the aisle would no doubt initiate thorough investigations. Now just imagine if Hunter was a Republican. The president's son does not deserve special treatment, period. Holding Hunter Biden in contempt of Congress is the responsible reaction to his blatant disregard for federal law and our duty to investigate potential wrongdoings by the President of the United States. This committee has analyzed thousands of pages of bank records, leading to the discovery of $24 million of wire transfers in payments from foreign companies and foreign nationals directly to this Biden family. Through interviews with Biden family closest associates, the committee discovered that Hunter Biden used his father's name and influence in meetings with foreign nationals over 20 times. Witness testimonies proved that Hunter Biden dined with foreign individuals from countries such as Russia, Ukraine, and Kazakhstan alongside his father, who is the sitting vice president of the United States. And the list of evidence goes on and on. The president himself has been exposed for lying. Both the White House and Hunter have used every tool at their disposal to obstruct this investigation and to block the gathering of evidence. This blatant corruption must be held to account. It's one of the major duties of this very committee. 
And that's why on September 12, 2023, as a result of the significant evidence against the current president, the Speaker of the House asked the Oversight Committee to conduct an inquiry to determine whether or not sufficient grounds existed for the impeachment of President Biden. Hunter Biden's testimony is a critical component of the impeachment inquiry into whether President Biden or his family personally profited from his office as vice president or his current role as president of the United States. And these facts cannot get in the way. The, we have got to get with it, with, on with this investigation and end the distractions that we've heard here today. Let's, let's, let's get this contempt uh, provision put forward and let's move forward with this in, impeachment inquiry. Will the gentleman yield, yield? Will the gentleman yield? Mr. Gosar, I we we'll yield my time to Mr. Gosar. Thank you very much, Mr. Langworthy. You know, to the, to the ranking member, you know, we're cherry picking, and to Mr. Lynch, we're cherry picking because if you go back to those uh, individuals we had as witnesses, they all said there doesn't exist that information now, but there exists the potential to be there. And the inquiry is different than an impeachment, it is a search for that document. So I think we got to be very, very careful when we're on both sides when we're talking about this that we give the whole picture, not part of the picture, the whole picture to this. And what's been found since then? Well, well once again, once again, there's, there's, there's stuff there. So I'm sorry? There is stuff there. There's stuff there? Yeah. So, can you, can you share it with us? Because, yeah, because when you stack up these random corporations, what are you producing? If I'm a manufacturer, I, I would do that. If the, I mean, have different businesses accomplishing that. They have nothing to sell. Some paintings? It was access to the president. So now whether that reaches high crimes and misdemeanors, I don't know. I'm not an attorney. But last but not least, I want to make sure that we also get to this, is that you, you did a process and you stated it. The language has been repeated over and over again. You do this massive hunt with attorneys, not people like dentists or you know, others. You do it with attorneys to gather that information. And then they selectively compile it you guys get questions, we get questions, and we cover the ground more efficiently. That's why this process works. I agree with you. You do the behind the doors, then you come out here for the public. I think there's no, no difference there. I yield back. Good. Chair now recognize Mr. Kassar for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my distinguished colleague, the gentlelady from Florida, held up a poster board uh, saying we should hold Hunter Biden in contempt because of a provision saying refusal of a witness to testify. But that doesn't apply in that we have a witness that was here and is willing to testify. Now I'll give everybody credit here. There seems to be disagreement about whether to do the closed door deposition, but there is an area of agreement. And the area of agreement is to have a public hearing. And so um, what I'm interested in, I'll yield a minute of time over to you chairman or somebody from the other side, we've been here for hours and I have still yet to figure out why we don't have Mr. Hunter Biden here to answer our questions for whatever period of time we want in front of the oversight committee. So I, I want to understand, I want to give Mr. Fallon credit, due credit from the great state of Texas for saying, well, he wants to make sure we have enough time. Mr. Chairman, I'm sure we could agree to whatever amount of time was necessary, but I'm having a lot of trouble understanding why the Republican majority won't take yes for an answer and ask questions of Hunter Biden here publicly. That, I, I think we would really learn because I'll, all I've been hearing on TV news is over and over again that we need to ask Hunter Biden questions. He's saying we can. Why refuse to have this public hearing that it sounds are, like? Are you yielding me? Issue? Yeah, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm well, happy to yield you 30 So seconds. we've obtained thousands of pages of bank documents. Uh, we've reviewed 170 suspicious activity reports from banks filed against the Bidens from my banking background. That's unprecedented to have that many bank violations that allege very serious things from money laundering to tax evasion to bribery. And we have a lot of questions. Uh, we want to treat him like any other witness. He doesn't get to set the rules. We will depose him. And, and look, we split time with Democrats. You all get an equal amount of time with Hunter Biden. Then we'll have a public hearing. But I guess my question is, if there is disagreement, and it sounds like there is, around the deposition. Why not have the public hearing? Is there well, a reason? We will is after there the reason? deposition. I, I understand, Mr. Chairman, but nobody has explained to me clearly yet, 
and I think to your, to your own districts, to my district, why not call Hunter Biden in tomorrow? Why not, have, why not ask him in next week? Uh, We're ready. Well, gentlemen, you know, I'd love to answer that you? question. Yes, you? Yeah, so I would have loved to have deposed him right here today. We but had a motion. We there's had a motion. Rules. You have three days. Let's do it in three days. No, but who, my who whole point is, is, is behind closed doors. I would have gone right now. He's here. He's got his legal representation there. Let's play this game. But we have rules that say you have three days. I'm not playing game one. I'm sure we could. Wa I'm sure we could waive the three days. Second, we could have it here in three days if there's agreement about if what we're hearing from the Republican side over and over and over again is. They've got questions for Hunter Biden. The quotes from this, own, from this hearing. Hunter Biden's testimony is so, critical. So, I want to so delve into questions yield. I have for Mr. Biden. So, so you, why, not ask for those, why not ask for that tomorrow? We the deposition tomorrow? No, we would have him here in public tomorrow. After? In front of everyone. After I, the I deposition. understand you're saying after the deposition. But well, my question for you is just very clearly. Why not have the public hearing tomorrow? Will the gentleman yield to that question? Yes, uh, sir. Mr. Chairman, if and Mr. Donalds, I want to compliment you because I remember our first oversight committee hearing. You said it would be good to have these real conversations. So I, I genuinely all, want to I am it. all for this, Mr. Kassar. I actually enjoy this part. If we ever get to it, look, the reality is, and you have attorneys on your side of the aisle, there is never any proceeding that takes place without a deposition of the witness. The reason why is because if something comes up in the round of questioning, Either A, members of this committee may not be prepared because they don't have all the information from the witness because the witness was never had given an opportunity with his attorneys present to actually give out that level of information. So you need the deposition process before you bring a witness into open hearing. This happens all the time. This is actually the protocol of the House. And, and, and Mr. Kassar, what your side of the aisle is requesting, with all due respect, is a deviation uh, from the historical precedent well, the of the House yield, of Representatives. I'll yield back to the ranking member. Well, but thank you for moving the ball forward with that explanation. Um, that has been the practice sometimes, not all times. There's a, w w the vast majority of witnesses who come before this committee come without being deposed first. We come and ask for their testimony. But in any event, even for a witness who's being subpoenaed, um, like Mr. Uh, Biden was, um, we have a completely different situation when the chairman goes out publicly and says, we will give you the choice, A or B. You can have a deposition or you can come in the hearing, but I challenge you, I invite you, I insist that you come before the committee and repeatedly says that. So I, that's why I think legally it's a very complex question, but I don't see why we take this all the way to the... All, all the way to court. If you guys really want to hear from him, let's have a public hearing and then depose him afterwards. But he's saying he doesn't want to be misrepresented. Thank time's, you for yielding. Time's expired. Chair, recognize Mr. Burleson from Missouri. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. What should be obvious to the American people, what I think we need to just say to the American people is that, is to point out that this kind of food fight, this kind of, this circus that people, that we've experienced <coughs> is the reason why we want to have a deposition. In, in a deposition, you don't get people distracting the American public with all these other topics. And during a deposition, they don't get to lie to the American people for five minutes at a time. They don't get to distract. They don't get to lie. And they don't get to, uh, to, uh, to divert from the facts of what's happening. Um, but what's, what I see happening is what's being telegraphed here is that they're, they're building a case, a political case, really, because that's what this is. It's all politics that, that they're entering into for why the Department of Justice or giving Merrick Garland a, an excuse, which we all knew that he would not prosecute, probably not prosecute um, the, these contempt charges, because it would be hypocritical if he did so. He would, because he prosecuted Steve Bannon even though Bannon was working, actually working for the president, and was able to raise the speech and debate clause that was mentioned in the Constitution, um, Merrick Garland still prosecuted him for that. Here's, the, here's what's really frustrating to the American people, and they see right through this. We're now going through a second process over really the same crimes that, it, that, that were committed when Joe Biden was vice president. And those crimes include the creation, the creation of, of dozens and dozens of limited liability companies, dozens of bank accounts. When, we, when, when people say, where are the facts? 
Well, I want to ask, what facts are you looking for? Because, because to me, bank records are facts. Suspicious activity reports are facts. Copies of checks are facts. When you juxtapose that with the WhatsApp message and what's on the Hunter Biden laptop and the, and the deposition from, from witnesses like Mr. Archer, when you, when you add to it further depositions, as we're going to hear about soon, uh, the art dealer, when you layer all that together, that's a compelling story. There's a lot of facts. And you know what? I would hate to be on the other side of the aisle and try to defend this situation. And, and so I think that the only outcome would be to, to distract, to try to make this a political process. But it still stands as a fact that in the, when, when the Democrats were in charge, they brought in the president's son. They brought him in multiple times, and they brought him into depositions, and he agreed. And this should be the, this is what the, should be the takeaway message to the American people. When the Trump family was, was asked, when they, they came in and they gave depositions, the Biden family, once again, Hunter Biden feels that he's privileged. He's privileged. He doesn't have to pay taxes like everyone else. He's privileged that apparently he can traffic sex workers across the globe and get away with it. He's privileged in that he can get away with, with acting as a foreign ad, advocate and, and be able to get away with it when other, pe when other people are prosecuted and sent to jail for the very same thing. The American people see that there's two standards of justice. And when we're trying to go about the people's business in a serious manner, we end up um, allowing a food fight, which is exactly why he did what he did when he, when he went across the street as far away as he could from this building and had his press conference, and then why he today showed up um, when, when, the, when the hour is way too late. I yield the remainder of my time. Ms. Brown. Ms. Brown. Chair recognizes Ms. Brown. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I am not a lawyer, and nor do I try to pretend to play one on TV. But it is plain for all of us to see we are here on behalf of one man, the self-proclaimed dictator on day one, the twice impeached, four times indicted, insurrection initiator and supporter, election denier, convicted fraudster, and maniacal manipulator from Mar-a-Lago. The one who lost and lost badly. We are here because my colleagues on the other side of the aisle have no positive agenda to run on. They have not accomplished one thing in their year in the majority to improve the lives of the people around this country. We are not here to hold the president in contempt of Congress. We are not even here to hold a member of President Biden's administration in contempt of Congress. For some reason, the majority has gathered us here to hold the president's son, his son, who I will remind all of us is not and has not ever been a government official in contempt of Congress, despite his willingness to come testify publicly before this committee. So getting to the truth was never their actual goal. Instead of working together to solve big problems on behalf of the American people, my Republican colleagues continue to pursue a meritless, groundless, baseless investigation into the president's family. Meanwhile, back in my district, during our recess, I was literally dodging bullets at a funeral of a gun violence victim. And I never felt so powerless and vulnerable because I know that when I got back here, my colleagues on the other side of the aisle refused to do anything about it. Yet, they continue to make efforts to ban books, rewrite history, make it harder for people that look like me to vote, and to make it harder for women to make their own health care decisions. We see nothing on the other side of the aisle, but distraction, 
diversion, deflection, delusion, divisiveness, and dangerous destruction of our ever so delicate democracy. So with that, I am tired of the political theater. I want to get to work for the people back home in the 11th Congressional District because they, quite frankly, don't care about Hunter Biden. Well, the and with yield. that, I will yield the balance of my time to my ranking member. Ms. Brown, thank you so much. You know, you started off by saying something pretty profound, which is we are here instead of doing the business of the American people because the Republicans have offered us no positive agenda in their year in office. We know we've wasted countless weeks in them just trying to pick a speaker. Um, and uh, we've wasted countless weeks with their inertia and their do-nothing policies. Um, but Ms. Brown, um, I don't know if you recall, I just don't want people having to take your word for it. I think numerous Republicans have gotten up on the floor of the House complaining about the fact that they have no agenda. I think our colleague Chip Roy <clears throat> from Texas said that the Republicans have not given him one thing, a single thing, I remember him saying, to campaign on. Um, so I just want to ask you, when you're saying that they have no agenda, that's not a partisan point. You're getting that from Republicans, aren't you? That is correct. One of, the, uh, one of our colleagues said that uh, there was Trump derangement syndrome. And of course, Trump derangement begins with Donald Trump himself. He thinks he has a legal right to assassinate US citizens. Um, he thinks he can grab women by their genitals, although that's not the word that he used. Uh, he's, he said that if Joe Biden is reelected president, there will be World War II. Um, he is obviously deranged and disoriented, but the real Trump derangement syndrome that I see is those people who cannot break from Donald Trump after he's proven himself to be completely and totally unworthy of your support because I'm looking at talented, gifted people on the other side of the aisle, the ones who have not left Congress in frustration or because they've broken with Donald Trump and clashed with him, but I'm still looking at people who have their wits about them, I think, but you're acting like cult members, like you're sleeping on the basement of a cult, listening to tapes all night, and I beg you to get over your Trump derangement syndrome. Thank you very much for yielding, Ms. Brown. Chair, recognize Mr. Donalds from Florida for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. A, a couple of things. First, it was said in this hearing, uh, Mr. Chairman, about you specifically, that you repeatedly said you would give uh, Mr. Biden any opportunity, he could choose which one to come and speak in front of this committee. He could do it by deposition, he could do it by open hearing. It was up to him. The truth of the matter, though, is, members, is that the chairman's words are not binding. Like, no other member's words of Congress are really not binding. The binding article. Point of order. Does the chairman agree not, with that? Point of order. Does the chairman my agree? Time? Are you going to restore my point time? Point of order. Just point of order. Okay. Does the chairman agree that the chairman's words are not binding on the committee? That's that, not a point of order. It's not, it has nothing to do with the order of this hearing. Thank you. Uh, can I go back to four minutes and 34 seconds? That's where I was before I was interrupted by Mr. Raskin. Yes. Reset, reset the Thank clock. Thank you. Thank you. What is binding is the actual written document, the written language in the subpoena, because a subpoena from this committee is also signed off on by the clerk of the House. That is the binding document that matters here. That is what governs. That's number one. Number two that was said in this hearing. It was said that our witnesses said that there was no basis for an impeachment. But remember, members on the Democrat side of the aisle, what was said by Mr. Turley at the time was that there was plenty of evidence for the continuation of an impeachment inquiry. And the purpose of that hearing was the relevance basis for an impeachment inquiry. The House has now voted for an impeachment inquiry. And one of the first things that the House did after the vote of an impeachment inquiry was to subpoena Hunter Biden to appear. Hunter Biden is, 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 has evaded that subpoena. So flagrantly did he evade it that he decided to show up at the Senate side to give a press conference, and Eric Swalwell, a member of the House, helped him get that time on the Senate side to give a press conference. That's a flagrant violation of a congressional subpoena. Secondarily, he has the gall to show up here when we're actually discussing contempt. And he didn't stay. He was sitting right over there. He's not here now. He said he wants to talk. He could have stayed through the whole proceeding. He chose to leave. That's his business. But he was subpoenaed to come here. 
back in December. He chose not to of his own volition. He's in violation of that subpoena, a subpoena that was executed with the signature of the clerk of the House of Representatives. That is the document that is binding. That's what we work off of. Mr. Mr. Chairman, I actually want to submit for the record an article from The Hill written by jo Jonathan Turley, and it is titled Eric Swalwell and the Politics of Contempt. Without objection, so ordered. Thank you. I'm glad something got admitted to the record. Last, a uh, couple other points. One quick point I want to make, and this is in reference to the minorities uh, report about this $7.8 uh, million. I want the minority to understand one very important distinction between President Biden and President Trump. President Trump has an international real estate portfolio that he has amassed over decades. I'm quite sure if you go back through all of the hotel receipts before he was president of the United States that you had foreign dignitaries staying at Trump hotels all across the, all across the world. Will the gentleman yield? I'm not gonna yield, Mr. Raskin, I'm making a point. Because they're actually very nice hotels. They look good. People like staying there. Um, he, president he, Trump was not running the Trump Organization when he was president of the United States. To my recollection, Eric Trump, the president's son, was actually running the Trump Organization when President Trump was president of the United States. So if he had a portfolio of hotels and people choose, you know, through Expedia, through Kayak, through Hotels.com, if they choose to go and stay there, how is that the president being in violation of what the emoluments cause? Is that what you're citing? Stop. Ladies and gentlemen, America, this is ridiculous. The Biden family has no business. They've never had a business except for politics. And the one thing that the Oversight Committee, in conjunction with the Ways and Means Committee and in conjunction with the Judiciary Committee, has always been able to demonstrate is that they shook down foreign nations for millions, millions, 26 million at the latest count, and growing, millions. And there was never any business entity involved except public corruption and a pay-for-play scheme. The House Oversight Committee would like to get to the bottom of this under the impeachment inquiry of the House. We have questions for Hunter Biden. We issued a subpoena for him to answer said questions. He ignored a congressional subpoena as a private citizen. There are many attorneys on the other side of the aisle. If you had one of your clients in your private practice ignore a congressional subpoena as a private citizen, you would advise them not to because they would be held in contempt and they would actually be punished by the Department of Justice. So I find it interesting well, to see today. Yield so I I'm can not going to yield, Mr. Goldman, because I had a question for you earlier. You didn't want to take my question, so I'm not going to take yours. Thank you. So in closing, I will say private citizens, yes, they have a responsibility to answer congressional subpoenas. They do. Hunter Biden had it, and he was flagrant. He decided to give a press conference. So we're going to do this business, and he should be held in contempt by the full House of Representatives. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Very good. Chair now recognize Ms. Norton from Washington, D.C. for five minutes. I, I, I yield my, I, my five minutes to Mr. Raskin. I would like to thank the distinguished delegate from the District of Columbia, and I need to correct the record because of several false statements made about the Foreign Emoluments Clause, Article 1, Section 9, Clause 8, although I do... Uh, appreciate the gentleman from Florida's attempt to at least engage on the matter of substance that uh, was raised so powerfully by Ms. Crockett. Now let's start with this. Article 1, Section 9, Clause 8 says that the, neither the President nor any member of Congress can receive a present in emolument, which means a payment, an office or a title from a prince, a king, a foreign government, quote, Mr. Donald, of any kind whatever of any kind, whatever, without going to Congress first and obtaining the consent of Congress. There's no hotel exception, Mr. Donald, to the Foreign Emoluments Clause. There's no international real estate syndicate exception to the Foreign Emoluments Clause, Mr. Donald. And also, I, I will take you up on your challenge to see whether uh, the Trump Hotel in Washington, the Trump Hotel in Las Vegas, the Trump Hotel on Fifth Avenue, the Trump Hotel at UN Plaza, the four of the more than 500 businesses that we got documentation for, whether they actually had the same level of business coming from Saudi Arabia, the communist bureaucrats of China, who were the leading spender, as you know, if you've read our report, the United Arab Emirates, Indonesia, India, 
Egypt, and so on. I, I will, we will make that comparison about what was done before. If you get the chairman to call off the ban on further documents coming from Mazar. So Have you ever stayed at a Trump hotel, Mr. Ex Rassi? Excuse, no, and I would, never would stay at a Trump hotel. I've got too much self-respect and concern for hotels. hygiene. So, but in any event, uh, Mr. Donald, you're totally wrong about what the Foreign Emoluments Clause stands for. Uh, Abraham Lincoln was given two elephant tusks by the King of Siam during the Civil War, and he liked them very much. He wanted to keep them, but he went to Congress which is what every other president did before and every president did since, right up until Donald Trump. And he asked whether he could keep the tusks. And Congress, though they loved Honest Abe, said, no, you can't keep them. I mean, John F. Kennedy was, was uh, offered citizenship by the people of Ireland because they loved him so much. And he refused to take it, saying that even though it didn't violate the letter of the Monuments Clause, it violated the spirit of the Monuments Clause. And Donald Trump converted the presidency into an instrument for self-enrichment. He raked in millions of dollars from the most corrupt governments on earth who came in with specific favor favors that we document in our report that they got from Donald Trump. I beseech my colleagues, I will read any book, any magazine, any speech you've given that you want me to read, read this report and come back and tell me if you think Donald Trump did the right thing in converting the White House into a for-profit operation. No other president in American history has come anywhere close. And you ask why he's so determined to stay in office that he would unleash violence against his own vice president, the brother of your colleague, of our colleague. Why would he do that? It's because it was a money-making operation, and it was, a, it was a great business grift for a guy who went bankrupt several times. And yet, out of some misguided partisan loyalty, you're going to stick with him. I don't even know why you stick with him. He was a Democrat longer than he was a Republican. He wanted to run for president on the Reform Party. You guys have been taken over by an absolute con man. And now you're acting like members of a religious cult who don't even remember how you got in in the first place. We say return the profits, Donald Trump, $7.8 million. I've got a letter, uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm going to share with you telling Donald Trump to return these $7.8 million. It's a small fraction of what he raked in. We want to know about the other two years in office. We want to know about uh, the other businesses, not just those four that we were able to get information on. And we want to know about every country on earth, not just the 20 uh, autocracies and dictatorships that we found. This is our government. This is our Constitution. And we're going to stand up for it against Donald Trump and anybody who follows him to the path of oblivion. Abraham Lincoln started your party as a third party to replace the Whigs because they wouldn't take a moral stand against slavery. It was a pro-freedom, anti-slavery, pro-union, pro-honesty party. And your party has been reduced to a corrupt, authoritarian cult of personality, and everybody does whatever Donald Trump tells them to do, which is what we're doing here today with this stupid attempt to hold Hunter Biden in contempt when he has come forward to say he will testify and give you everything you want as the chairman of the committee repeatedly offered in public. So forgive my outrage and indignation, but enough is enough. Let's get back to the business of the people, as Ms. Chair Brown recognizes said. Mr. Higgins for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, the American people may be surprised to know some of my colleagues across the aisle hasn't served as long as we have. Might be surprised to know that Representative Raskin and I had, had been building quite a, a colleague friendship in my original years of service prior to J6 especially. We would visit and we would we would debate constitutionalist questions and he and he honored me by observation of my what he would sometimes call compelling arguments contradictory to his own. So it's it's with sincerity that I say congratulations to my colleague, Mr. Raskin, because you have obviously fully recovered from your cancer treatments. You you Thank you, you, my dear friend, and I do quite, love you. You're quite animated, and I, I, believe, I believe there's a direct correlation between your testimony against former President Trump and his poll numbers, because I'm watching a live feed. The more you talk about him, the more his numbers go up. So I may yield you more time. 
But I, I would, honestly, I'd like to ask you if, if I could, regarding the deposition, just from a calm, if we could take a step back from the emotion here and the political conflict and this sort of prepared for battle debate we're in here. Just regarding depositions, we've all been through depositions in one way or another. They're very cold and calculated, and you have your attorney there, and then the bad guys, there's always those the other guys. They have their attorneys, and you're either being sued or you're part of a suit. You're either a defendant or the plaintiff, and you're in a room for hours until all the questions have been asked. So, sincerely, why, if you were Hunter's um, attorney or advisor, why would you advise him not to participate in a deposition wherein his own attorney is there, it's private and everything is transcribed, his words cannot be twisted by the, by the fake news? Um, just tell us, Mr. Raskin, and I yield for your answer. Thank you kindly, and I should tell you that your feelings are not unrequited. Uh, I still have very fond and warm feelings for you. I'm sorry that January 6th uh, came between us, and I look forward to a day in our republic when we will be really good friends again. But in a direct answer to your question, I, if I were his lawyer and I were his advisor, I would never advise him not to come and testify before the committee, except for one thing. And this is why, and I started out this way. But specifically, I, am I asking about deposition? Yes, about de deposition. Because right. we want the deposition first, I would clarify, no, but, and then the but, uh, public uh, testimony. So just to answer your question, I would recommend it, except that they were publicly given the offer numerous times to come before the whole committee, and they state a fear on their part, which is not unreasonable, that their words will be distorted, and the transcript of the interview will never be released because... The vast majority of the transcribed interviews have not been released, and I would use this okay, as an opportunity say, to call on the chairman. Let me to just release. say that I yeah. think that's that's solid counsel, but that brings us to our next point, my next point, which is that, that as a free American, which, I mean, to a certain extent, we still have some individual rights and freedoms, including to not comply with a subpoena. But did, so as a, as a free American, Hunter Biden has a right to not comply with the congressional subpoena, but we have the right to take the next step as a Congress. If we believe the subpoena was righteous and, and his noncompliance with that subpoena was unrighteous, if we believe that our subpoena was lawful and we have presented probable cause and lawful argument to support that subpoena, then we have not only the right, but we have the obligation to consider that he was in contempt of Congress when he took that stand of noncompliance, which is where we are right now. Doesn't have to be emotional. The man had the right to not show up. We have the right to hold him in contempt, and that's what's happening. So. They, by all means, as my colleagues have stated, let us move forward with the, with the people's business. The people's business today in this committee is to move forward with the vote to hold Hunter Biden in contempt. Mr. Chairman, I yield. Gentleman yields back. Does any other member wish to be heard before we begin the amendment process? Seeing none, I understand there's an amendment at the desk. Oh, Mr. Cloud. I'm sorry, I didn't recognize. Mr. Cloud from Texas for five minutes. Well, in the true D.C. meeting maxim of everything's been said, but not everyone's said it, since uh, I haven't said anything yet, I'll go ahead and, and mention it. But uh, we've heard words about irrefutable evidence being presented, and, you know, I just have to say I don't think that word means what you think it means. And there's a stark contrast, as that been pointed out, between how the Democrats have investigated and how we investigated. They, they are opposed to a closed-door deposition, which they've held a number of times. As a matter of fact, during the impeachment hearings, I sat in the skiff along with others while they withheld the transcripts that they are worried about. And so uh, it, 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 oftentimes it seems like their uh, motivations are, are, they're portraying their motivations uh, on, on, our, on us, and, and that's just not the case. I remember sitting, for example, in, in one of the hearings, and one of the witnesses who worked at the White House was asked, did you, 
did the president talk to you before coming here? And said, well, we passed in the hallway and had a conversation. What did he say? Just tell the truth. Ironically, that part didn't leak from, from the committee hearing, but a number of lies did. And, and let's also look at how these two investigations got started. One was based on evidence that was false, false evidence that was paid for uh, by a political opponent of, of Trump as a candidate uh, and, and and created a whole Russian collusion narrative uh, that we spent millions of government tax dollars on uh, perpetrating this this big lie uh, that our colleagues on the other side helped promote. Uh, this one began with a laptop that Hunter Biden produced himself uh, and then was backed up with bank docu documents and, and then evidence of shell companies all over the place. And then there's talk about the business uh, the fact that Trump's business has made money uh, from from people who stay at the hotels, is that not shocking? I think every American expected that people in other countries where his some of his hotels are might have stayed at those hotels. That is not a shocking thing. But the big difference, of course, is that President Trump and his son is not manning the reservation desk. And they're not the ones answering the call and handing it over and saying, the big guy's sitting with me, would you like a room at the hotel? That is not happening. Uh, but yet for these shell companies that Hunter Biden has set up and the Biden family, uh, that's exactly what we've seen has been happening. And I would say that money that comes into the Trump organization doesn't go directly. Now, I'm sure there's some return on the investment that the Trump family has made, but it also employs several employees that get money from that what comes in. I doubt that these 20 shell companies have nearly the employees of one hotel in, that, that uh, Trump property has, probably not as many hotel or as many employees as you would find in the lobby, uh, working the lobby of one of these hotels. So this is completely, completely, completely different. They're trying to compare apples and oranges and confuse the American people back home. It's totally, totally not the case. And getting back to the point of today's hearing, this really is uh, about contempt. And so uh, what we've seen happen is Hunter Biden has come here now twice just to not speak to this committee. So contempt is defined as a lack of respect or reverence for something, a willful disobedience or open disrespect for a court judge and legislative body. He flew all the way over here the day he was scheduled for a deposition just to not appear and to kind of thumb his nose here at this body. Today he showed up. And the minority is trying to make the case, well, he showed up to speak. We've been here a couple times. I've been in a couple committee hearings, not nearly as many as many of the members here. Never have I seen a witness show up when they want to show up on any sort of thing to say, hey, I'm here to speak on what I want to speak about. That is not how Congress works. That's not how any meeting on the Hill works. That's ridiculous to think that somebody's going to be able to show up and just mandate the agenda for today's meeting, which is further evidence of why he is holding Congress in contempt. He thinks he's above the law. He thinks it has no weight on him, and understandably so for the moment because the DOJ refuses to follow up on anything and has done their best effort to work with the IRS and other uh, agencies to shield and protect the Biden family. This is important. We have to hold them in contempt, and I yield back. The gentleman yields back. Does any other member wish to be heard before we begin the amendment process? Uh, seeing none, I understand there's an amendment at the desk. Yes. Mr. Chairman, I have, a, I have an amendment at the desk. For what purpose does uh, Mr. Goldman seek recognition? Uh, my apologies for jumping ahead. I have an amendment at the desk. Uh, the clerk will distribute the amendment to all members. Do we, does everyone have the amendment? No, all right, we're going to let the clerk distribute the amendment. I believe it was changed in the last little bit. That's okay. I, I would ask that the clerk read the amendment. My apologies, I withdraw. While we're waiting for everyone to review the amendment, I'll say we had three hours of opening statements. So hopefully we can get through these amendments in time.
just a note, we're working on printing the amendment because we just got it. Do you want to start with another one, Jim? Do you want to start you again? The clerk will designate the amendment. Amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute as offered by Mr. Goldman of New York. Without objection, the amendment is considered as read. I reserve a point of order. The gentleman from New York is recognized for five minutes to explain his amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This amendment uh, would strike all of the resolve clauses and the report, and it would insert language that details all of the extensive efforts to cooperate that Hunter Biden and his attorney have made in response to this committee's requests for testimony and information from him that began in February when Chairman Comer wrote uh, to request documents and communications related to our, our investigation of President Biden's involvement in your financial conduct. The following day, his attorney wrote back to Chairman Comer offering to sit down with the staff to discuss the request. Then, seven months later, Chairman Comer goes on television and said he never got a response back from Hunter Biden, which is flat out false. And the next, that day, Hunter Biden's attorney wrote again to Chairman Comer to say that he did respond, he never heard a response, but that he remains available to have a discussion. So next, without any response from the chairman, we went, you went straight into a subpoena. Uh, the subpoena was for testimony, and the, the witness, Hunter Biden, has put no conditions or limitations on his testimony. There are no limits on the topics. There's no limits on the length of time. He's happy to do it under oath. He has said he would not assert the Fifth Amendment privilege, even though that's available to him. That's in stark contrast to Devin Archer, their star witness, who so narrowly limited the time and scope of his testimony that we could not ask him anything about any of his own criminal conduct. But the only request that Hunter Biden has made is that he wants to give his testimony in public, not behind a closed door deposition where his transcript wouldn't be released. There's absolutely no certainty or guarantee that there would ever be a public hearing again, and I would bet a lot of money that you will never put him in that witness chair, whether or not he comes in. That's all he wanted, just to speak to the American people. He has not, unlike your dear leader, filed a lawsuit to prevent third parties from turning over financial information. In fact, you've received tens of thousands of bank records the problem you have is not Hunter Biden's cooperation. It's that all of those bank records, which would show any connection between Hunter Biden and his father, if there were any, has zero, zero money going from Hunter Biden to Joe Biden related to any of his business ventures. You so your problem is that the evidence doesn't 
show what you say it does. It's not that he's not cooperating, so that's why we're here today, so that you can change the topic, can claim that there's some kind of obstruction, and therefore Hunter Biden really did do all of these terrible things, and Hunter Biden should be impeached. Oh, wait, no, no. It's not Hunter Biden who's being impeached here. Now, this is far worse because the chairman, as we've discussed many times, has multiple times offered Hunter Biden to come testify in public. So if you had wanted a closed door deposition, I don't understand why you would go on TV, Mr. Chairman, and offer for Hunter Biden to come in and testify publicly, whichever he chooses. So why no public hearing? Why won't you have a public hearing? The only request, this is an incredibly cooperative witness. We've all dealt with many witnesses who put a lot of restrictions on their testimony. There's one request, one request of Hunter Biden, which is to speak directly to the American people, not in a closed door to the Republicans who will control the release, the dissemination, and the misinformation from that testimony. Why not? Okay. Well, one of your own colleagues went on the House floor last fall and said that this impeachment investigation was, quote, failure theater, unquote. A Republican said that. So the theory here must be let's avoid the theater part of that and just keep the failure behind closed doors. Last month, Hunter Biden showed up to the Capitol on the day that he was subpoenaed, ready to testify in this hearing room. You refused to take his testimony. That very same afternoon, you went on the House floor to vote for an impeachment resolution on the rationale that you needed to pass a resolution to get more evidence. You reject evidence in the morning, and then you cry foul about no evidence in the afternoon. He's ready to testify, and this is a dangerous precedent you're setting if every single line in every single Suprina must be adhered to or you're going to hold in contempt. I know my colleagues on the other side of the aisle who defied subpoenas outright would be very afraid if that right, became the standard expired. here. And I yield back. And I'll recognize myself. I oppose this amendment. This amendment claims that Hunter Biden has cooperated with this committee's investigation. How has he cooperated with the investigation if he has not abided by a congressional subpoena? Abby Lowell has never discussed scope or logic with us, and we have identified at least two checks directly to Joe Biden where we traced the money directly through the Biden influence peddling schemes. That is a fact. We have published evidence. This isn't like Adam Schiff and the Steele dossier where he, you just make stuff up. We have produced bank records, and bank records don't lie. So Mr. Biden mocked our legitimate congressional impeachment inquiry and flew to D.C. to hang out outside of Congress and did not show his face for a deposition. He is not in compliance. He openly defied a congressional subpoena. Do any other members wish to speak on this amendment? Um, Mr. Chairman. Chair, Chair recognizes Mr. Raskin. Um, I, I, I want to yield back to Mr. Goldman. Before I do, I just want to pose a question to you. When you said that there was the documented checks involving the president in an influence scheme, are you referring to the auto loan repayment checks between Joe and Hunter Biden? You mean the poor she got from Uzbekistan? What, which auto are you? I, I don't know what kind of car, but are, are those the checks that you're referring the, to? The checks we're referring to were uh, a check for $200,000 that came through the influence peddling scheme with AmeriCorps Health and the $40,000 check that came through the influence peddling scheme with China, where I believe Mr. Bobulinski has stated publicly was a company that Joe Biden was supposed to be 10% owner. Okay, I'll reclaim my time. I think... In both cases, I mean, there were a lot of words there, Mr. Mr. Chairman, uh, but I think you're referring to the auto loan repayment with Hunter Biden. You're referring to the James Biden repayment. But <clears throat> if you've got documented receipts of foreign governments giving money directly to President Joe Biden, that's an outrageous violation of the Monuments Clause, like the $7.8 million that Donald Trump pocketed while he was president, which for some reason you guys don't care about because you think the Constitution only applies to Democrats and not to Donald Trump because, hey, that, you know, that's an that's a identifying characteristic of an authoritarian political party. It's got 
uh, a charismatic leader whose word is considered above the Constitution, above the rule of law. You refuse to accept the results of democratic elections that don't go your way if you're an authoritarian party. And then you refuse to disavow or you embrace political violence as an instrument for obtaining and maintaining political power. So you guys didn't like when uh, President Biden said that your party under Donald Trump has fallen into semi-fascist ways of operation. If the shoe semi-fits, you semi-wear it, okay? Now, I'd like to yield back to uh, Mr. Would, would the gentleman yield to a question? Well, the, um, yeah, I'll take okay. a quick question. Good, I just want to clarify. We, we have a wire that went directly from CEFC, which banks have identified as a state-owned entity from China, that this wire went from CEFC to Hunter Biden, than to Joe Biden for $40,000. Okay. Joe Biden has been directly implicated in the family okay. influence peddling scheme at least okay, three times. I, I, no, you, you haven't. You, you, you have not. I've not, not ever seen that. You, you have not well, produced the bank memo. You, you have not produced that. The $40,000 is for Jim Biden. But, 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 no, 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 no. The $200,000 is, from, is for, from Jim Biden. The $40,000 is from Hunter Biden. All right, but please produce I, the I documentation. We have, I have it. it. We have four bank we, memorandums. You give it to the members of this committee and four we, bank memorandums. Okay, I'll, I'll reclaim four. my time, Mr. There Tripp. has never been a more substantive. I'm saving my time. You go ahead, but I'm saving my time. In the seven years I've been in Congress. All right, let me say this: the Democrats undertook a serious investigation, despite every effort by the chairman to undermine it, and we determined there were 7.8 million dollars documented receipts from foreign governments to Donald Trump. You guys don't care about that. That's unfortunate. Will the yield? But if you've got documents- Will the ranking member yield? Yeah, we will in just a moment. Let me make my point, okay? Uh, if you have documented of foreign governments writing checks or giving credit card payments to Joe Biden, show it to us. We've been at this for a year now. We haven't seen anything. Then we show you in our more than 100-page report the documented receipts of money going to Donald Trump, but you don't care about it. In other words, you don't care about the principle that our government leaders should not be on the take from foreign governments. That's outrageous. Well, the because I, I, I will oppose any government official of any political party who's on the take with money from foreign governments, and I hope you would join me in that. And yet we've shown it to you, and yet you guys don't care about it. I mean, that's just unfathomable to me. Now, at least the, the Trump family has responded to it. Well, I mean, the they're very nervous about it. You know what Trump said? The Trump's people say, well, he didn't take his $400,000 government salary. You know what? That's the only thing you're allowed to take is your salary from Americans, not money from corrupt Saudi monarchs who order the assassination of journalists, not from Chinese communist bureaucrats crushing the human rights of people in Tibet and the Uyghurs. You're not supposed to be on the take from those governments. That's what our Constitution says. Then they say, well, we return the profits. These guys don't, these guys think it's, well, if it's a hotel, they could just keep the money. At least the Trump family understands some lawyer told them what the Constitution says. We return the profits. Well, guess what? They didn't give us the accounting of the profits, and that's not what the Constitution says. The Constitution says you can't take any payments at all from a foreign government without going to the Congress of the United States. It's not that you can't keep the profits from foreign governments. Do you guys understand what you're doing here? You're putting that Gentlemen, White Gentlemen, time's sale. expired. Chair, recognize Mr. Timmon from uh, South Carolina. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My colleagues across the aisle missed the point here. The Trump family has uh, pre-existing businesses built over decades, hotels all over the world, and President Trump divested himself of control over those businesses to his children, and business uh, arms link transactions between foreign governments and between uh, the Trump International Hotel chain, it, there's actually an arms link transaction. They're getting hotel rooms, they're getting food and uh, whatever from these hotels. So. The difference is this, the Biden family doesn't produce anything. They don't have anything. They don't have hotels. They don't have services rendered. There are none. Hunter Biden has said that he was on the board of Burisma and he has no qualifications. They actually cannot document any service rendered by the Biden family, whether it's Jim Biden, whether it's Hunter Biden. So that's the issue. The issue is that the Biden family, all they have is the big guy and his policy uh, favoritism. And that's why we're here. And I, I just think y'all are muddy in the water, and it's not doing the American people justice. Would With the that, gentleman yield? yield back. Would the gentleman yield? Yes, I will yield to. I thank the gentleman. I, I do want to point out that, to the point that Mr. Timmons was making, that 
the operation of the Trump Hotel was a legitimate enterprise that was approved by this committee in 2013 before President Trump was elected to office. Uh, but prior to that, it was the old post office that was losing $6 million per year. The turnaround was a plus $3 million that went to the federal government. And as Mr. Timmons pointed out, it was divested to the family, to the to the children. Well, it's not run by the president. Will you yield for a question on that? I'll yield for a question. Well, when you say it was divested, are you claiming that Donald Trump surrendered any ownership interest? Because he continued to own it. He put it into a trust for his sole benefit. He said the day-to-day -day management would be turned over to his sons. But he was still the beneficial owner of it. And he stayed involved, as we know, because he kept talking about all the business that was coming in from abroad. Well, the gentleman's question is legitimate in the context that most elected officials put their assets in trust for their own benefit after they leave office. But he it was not a blind not trust. Forced. He should not be forced to... Uh, divest himself of the asset, an asset that was approved by this committee. No, no I'm afraid Mr. not. You're I'm, referring I'm reclaiming, to... I'm reclaiming okay. the time yielded to me by Mr. Timmons to point out that what, what is happening right here should concern every American citizen because we refuse to prosecute, to investigate, prosecute corruption. We, we are constantly pounded about corruption in other countries, but we've got corruption right here that we do not... We, we form partisan sides on this thing, and we don't do our job. We have done, I've been here nine years and seven days and gone through multiple hearings in the Oversight Committee dealing with corruption, and it turns into a partisan uh, battle when we ought to be trying to make sure that we restore the American people's confidence in this government. What, we, what Hunter Biden should have done, he should have presented himself an answer to the subpoena. I'm not, I'm not trying to, to take sides in this. I want the evidence to speak for itself, and it will never speak for itself if we don't have people come before the committee as they're required to do. Will well, the gentleman yield for a question? Can I, would you yield for one final question? I'll yield to the gentleman. Thank you kindly. Um, and, and thank you for the spirit and the substance of your remarks, uh, which I think significantly uplift the tone of the conversation. Um, you would agree with me that the Emoluments Clause applies to government officials, and presumably you would agree with me that Hunter Biden is not and has never been a government official. So this is about a relative of the president, right? So we have Donald Trump, who's collecting $7.8 million at least. It's probably four or five times that much, and that's just during the presidency. But he, And he Mr. was Timmons, president. Mr. my time. And he was president. It's Mr. Time. Timmons' time. Uh, uh, oh. Ranking member, do you have any evidence that Donald Trump received any of this money you're alleging that was received by the Trump Hotel Organization? Yes, he bragged about it, and in fact, he returned right. what he called the profits to the government, which gave the game right, so, away. So $8 million in revenue, of which you don't know what the costs were associated with that, and you don't have any evidence that the president actually received any of this money, by the way. Oh, we've got all the evidence. Read our, have you read our so, report yet, Mr. Timmons? What, what is the amount of money that you allege he's received? $7.8 million, million, and it's, it's a tiny true. fraction. That's just factually inaccurate. Have you read our report? That's revenue. It's not, I, it's not, I it's not profit. I you to read the report. I'll read any book you want me to read, any poem, any ghost story, whatever it is. <laughs> read the report, well, please. Gentlemen, read the report. Yield, please. Uh, my time's expired, Mr. Chairman. Right, gentlemen, time's expired. Before I recognize the next member, since Mr. Raskin's into reading, okay. I'd like to submit uh, to the record the last bank memorandum, the bank memorandum that details the Chinese wire that went to Hunter Biden, then to Joe Biden. It's in the bank memorandum. Very, this is this is substantive memorandum. This is the fourth memorandum. If you need the other three, we will resend them to you. Mr. Chairman, can I introduce without, something for the record, too, before we without, Yes, but uh, without objection, we entered in the fourth bank memorandum into the record. Now you have something, Mr. Ashkin. Yes, um, this comes from Newsweek. Uh, this is uh, Republican Congressman Andy Biggs warns his party has, quote, nothing to campaign on. Uh, without objection. I object. So ordered. I object. It has nothing to do with subject at hand. Oh, well, it was very much discussed by the members today. I, I still object. Okay, could I call for a vote on that then, Mr. Chairman? Yeah? Yeah, we, I mean. All right, thank you. We, 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 Let's get our members we'll to vote. We'll, we'll, we'll do a, we'll, all right, all those in favor of entering into the record, a new aye. story, say aye. Aye. All those opposed, no, no. It's a okay. recorded vote, Mr. Chairman, recorded vote. Recorded votes uh, called is
previously announced, further proceedings on the question will be postponed. We have votes coming up on the House floor, so. All right. Uh, okay. Uh, we have votes on the House floor. Have they been called? Votes on the House floor are going to be called in, in 30 minutes. We will recess until uh, the last vote has been uh, recorded. Then we'll reconvene and take up the amendments and the, and the votes. So without objection, uh, the committee is now in recess.
And this area has not voted, no. No. They're still doing amendments and stuff.
don't speak a lot. Oh, she reps all Oh, okay. <laughs> Yes, 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 yes. That's obvious. Yeah. Uh, so Scott and uh, Lindy don't need to recognize the other. Yeah. You know, maybe a couple of us. You, know, you can cover that. I'm, I'm exclusively the Senate. Oh, you really don't even file those others? Or you don't no, we're we're here them? for that, for the Senate offices. Uh, that that's so. No, I know that part. But if, if I do grab something, we can move it up. We we send it over to the House side. Really do yeah. like you know if they're there. If, if well, I think the reps bring their staff, so because I know some staff were, it may have been for Rosendale were setting it up. Right, I mean, it seems like it's his issue. It seems like it's his issue. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, no, I assume he's rearranged the host on this side. Yeah. For whatever yeah. reason. Somebody come in and spin all the lights. What's that? Somebody come in and spin. It feels like it. They're hot as hell. Yeah, they're spotting on like. It's all weird now. Yeah. 
wanted somebody to turn their mustaches on the I know. Poor yeah, they need some of the mayor's government protests. Like a favorite uncle, and uh, yeah, it's been around for like 10 years. Just like here, they're using more plexic cups there than they used to last year. not impede the affairs of states. Okay, um, thank you everybody for showing up today. Uh, obviously, we've got a lot of really big important things that we're trying to address. 
here in the nation's capital. I want to thank the press for showing up uh, to show your interest and share this information with the general public. I want to thank the Senate for accommodating us and joining us in this important issue today. And I want to thank my colleagues from the House who have been talking about this for quite some time. Uh, the two biggest issues that face our nation right now, the two largest threats that face our nation right now are the mounting debt at $34 trillion and the absolutely open southern border. They both are posing uh, not just financial burdens, but national security threats that are real. We've been trying to address the problems since Biden took office, and they continue to get worse. We've had record amounts of illegals that have been entering our country, both those that have been detected and have encounters with law enforcement, and the several million that have come in without even making an encounter with law enforcement, which creates a grave danger. The law enforcement officials down on the southern border no longer call this an immigration problem. They call it a slave trade problem. I've talked to them personally. Every single person that comes into this country illegally has got a financial obligation to pay to the cartel, and they are being forced into slavery and servitude for years to come. We've got fentanyl problems. Thousand, hundred thousand a year deaths, somewhere between 70 and 100,000 a year deaths from fentanyl. We know it's coming in from the Mexican border. We know that the components are coming from China. That boils down to about 350 people a day. If we had a large jet go down with 350 victims inside of it, the, the United States government would ground those aircraft. We saw them ground aircraft last week because a door blew off, and fortunately, we never lost a soul. But if 350 deaths a day were taking place, they certainly would. And yet, they turned the other way. We've got terrorists that are entering our country. Last week, before the House of Representatives went down to Eagle Pass, there were 10,000 illegals that had been herded up together. And I talked to CBP, and they said that there were 200 people of special interest that were amongst that group. They were trying to get additional information. They wanted to vet them. They wanted to find out where they came from and what they were planning to do once they got into our country. And they were whisked away and distributed around our country, just like the other 10,000 remaining illegals were. Again, this is an imminent national security threat. And at the same time all of that is taking place, we have cartels that are being enriched. In the Del Rio sector alone, they're making roughly $32 million a week off of that slave trade that this administration has been supporting. This is our obligation. Everybody swore to uphold and to defend the Constitution. And the largest obligation that we have as members of Congress is to secure our nation. We're not doing it. But this is our opportunity to do so right now. When these two major issues come together, where you have funding that is necessary for large parts of the government and a policy matter that is compromising our national security, and that's why this group has got together and said, we're not going to spend additional funding for the federal government until we can see our border secure. And that's either going to be in the form of passage of H.R. 2, which is in the Senate right now, or a multitude of other immigration policies that I will be introducing tomorrow. Again, we've got a large group here. Everybody has something very important to say, and then we'll take some questions at the end. Right now, I would like to uh, bring up my very good friend from Florida, Senator Rick Scott. Thank you. So I want to thank uh, my friends from the House and from the Senate for being here today. We have a lawless administration. Let's, let's just all admit it. When Trump was president, the border was pretty secure. We have a new president, the border is unsecure. It wasn't that the laws didn't change. We have the exact same laws. We have an administration that has decided not to enforce the law. So we have drugs all across the country. We have criminals. We have terrorists. And we had, we had Director Ray come and testify. He testified in Homeland Security when I asked him a question. And Mallorca was sitting right next to him. As a result of an open southern border, do we have terror cells in this country? And he said, yes. I think every one of us care about our families. Every one of us cares about our families. I mean, do we want terrorists in our country? Do we want more crime in our country? Do we want more drugs in our country? And this administration is doing it. They're doing it each and every day. 
So what we have to do is we have to take every opportunity we can to say we are not going to pass additional legislation or whatever, whatever, whatever form, whether it's funding, whether it's Ukraine aid, whatever it is, until we get this border secure. And the only way we're going to get the border secure because we have a lawless administration is we've got to tie what the administration wants, whether it's Ukraine aid or funding, to a real secure border, to a border that goes down to the number of people crossing and staying is down to where it was when Trump was president. We can all do this. Now, we do, we're also talking about, as you know, we're talking about uh, funding. Let's look at what we did in the, uh, in the omnibus uh, a little over a year ago. And this is why people in the country are furious with us. They're furious with Congress over spending. We have $34 trillion of debt. We added a trillion dollars of debt, right, just since September. Our GDP is growing slower than our debt growth. It's not sustainable. We're not going to get inflation down. We're not going to get interest rates down. Now this is coming down. But here's an example of some things that were in last year's omnibus bill. $3.52 or $3.62 million for the Michelle Obama Trail in Georgia. If you go to my state, you think people say, oh, my, that was a good expenditure. How about $1.8 million to pay for the, fit, for the bus fare of people in Olympia, Washington. So they don't have to pay bus fare. You think people in, in, in Florida think that was good spending? Seven million dollars for staircases in the city of the fixed staircase in the city of Pittsburgh. Why should we be funding that at the federal level? Two point five million dollars for a Chinatown arts building in San Francisco. People are furious with this stuff. So why don't we start doing our job? Secure our border, and we can balance our budget. We we do it personally. I did when I was governor for eight straight years, even though I walked in with a big budget deficit. We ought to start doing the exact same thing here. Let's live within our means. Let's start solving the problems of this country. One of the biggest problems is an open southern border. Now we're going to have is Bob Good here. Yes. There's an expression that um, if everyone's family, no one is. And there's a corollary to the federal government. If everything is federal, then nothing is. When we're so busy funding the reconstruction of a uh, random staircase in some city or paying the uh, bus fares for residents of another city or doing all sorts of things that the federal government was never intended to be, do, or fund, all of a sudden we find that the few things that the federal government is in charge of doing exclusively can't reasonably be accomplished because we're so spread out doing so many things. I want to make very clear, uh, clear up a, a misconception that has been widely disseminated. The humanitarian and rule of law crisis unfolding along our southern border, and it truly is a, uh, a, an unprecedented humanitarian crisis, is not there because of a lack of adequate federal legislation. Now, sure, uh, our immigration code is a mess. A lot of it was developed over a long period of time uh, through the Buddy Holly era and a little bit since then. And, and, and some things need to be tightened, no question about that. But President Biden has every authority that he would need. He has plenty of authority today to secure the border. The reason this is happening is not for want of adequate federal legislation. It's for a lack of will to enforce that legislation, or better said, a willful desire to not enforce that legislation. Let's just look at a couple of things. First of all, asylum. A lot of this started through the asylum process when these uncontrolled waves of illegal immigration commenced on or about January 20, 2021, the day that Joe Biden was inaugurated President of the United States. Um, a lot of those were processed uh, 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 through the asylum process. They were said to be asylum applicants. It's important to remember that there is no cognizable, unconditional right to asylum under federal law. It is rather a discretionary grant of authority to the Secretary of Homeland Security who may, who may grant asylum uh, to those who qualify under the standards that we have under federal law. There are corresponding requirements that anticipate that when we have more asylum applicants than we have, there's no obligation to just say, okay, well, you're here, so we're going to write down your name on a piece of paper and send you off uh, into the interior of the United States after buying you a plane ticket, allowing you to board said plane without identification, without a passport, a driver's license, or anything else telling us who you are. 
And we'll give you a little slip of paper that says one day you'll be called up for an immigration hearing. Can't tell you when that will happen, but it may be a decade or more, maybe 12 years in, for that matter before you get it. In the meantime, have fun. And by the way, within short order, uh, uh, you, you'll receive a, uh, a work permit. There is nothing in federal law that says that that is the answer. In fact, federal law contemplates that if we run out of bed space as we quickly did right after Joe Biden took office because he shut down the Remain in Mexico program, litigated it, was ordered by a court to reinstate it, then he drew it and ran out the clock and is to this day refusing to comply with that court order. His response is, oh, let's just let him go. But there is no reason why he has to do that. When you hear him speak, you will hear him speak in terms that will lead you to think that all of this is the inevitable, inexorable result of federal law that leaves him no choice but to unleash 10 million illegal immigrants on the American people. Now, this is his choice. He has chosen to do this. This was willful. Remember what was asked to his Homeland Security Secretary uh, uh, around about the time Joe Biden took office. I think it may have been even before Secretary Mayorkas was confirmed by the Senate, uh, somewhere in that time frame. Somebody asked him, uh, what would you say to those traveling up through these caravans? Now, he could have, I wish he would have, said something like, uh, don't come, uh, follow our laws to do that, apply for asylum uh, outside the United States, go to a U.S. embassy, figure out what your options are, but don't just walk up here and enter in violation of our laws. No, he didn't say that. He instead said, it may take us a few weeks to become fully prepared to accept you. During that time, they had a lot to do, like shutting down the Remain in Mexico program, which had previously been negotiated uh, to require people who enter by land without documentation at our southern border, presenting themselves as asylum applicants, to remain in Mexico during the pendency of their asylum applications. To this day, President Biden could and should reinstate re Remain in Mexico program. He could also direct his Homeland Security Secretary, reminding him of the may-shall distinction that this is only a may grant of authority and not a shall grant of a duty that the answer when you're overwhelmed, when you don't have enough bed space, when you don't have enough immigration judges to adjudicate these things, the answer is to shut the thing down. Stop taking them in. Stop paying for their plane ticket, moving them to the interior. Think about how twisted this is. If any of you have traveled outside the United States within the last few years, you know how critical that passport is. If you lose the passport while you're outside the country, it happens all the time, you hear from constituents all the time. You're not getting back in easily. It's going to be a long slog. You're, you're going to have to figure out a way to get a passport granted, or it's going to be tough to get back in the United States. These guys are not U.S. citizens. They've never paid U.S. taxes. They have no claim to this as their homeland. They're allowed in. We don't know who they are, but in some cases we do. You know, it's nothing short of terrifying that during this administration, 279 known terrorists have been admitted into this country, along with the 10 million illegal aliens who have come here. Now, the Biden administration will brag as if it were a, a feat of great accomplishment that they've deported 5,993 illegal immigrants entering this country unlawfully during their time in office. Sounds really impressive until you do the math and you realize that they've released 99.7% of everyone coming into this country illegally. Don't tell me this is for want of federal legislation. This is for want of an utter, defiant, lawless refusal to enforce our border. Finally, do not fall for the mistake that this is somehow wrong, this is somehow xenophobic and intolerant not to allow anyone who wants to come into this country, uh, uh, or, or that it's discriminatory against the ethnicities of those who might be coming. I mean, it has nothing to do with it. Uh, like I lived and worked among the poorest of the poor on the U.S.-Mexico border in southern Texas in the McAllen, Texas area uh, 30 years ago. Even then, long before there were these huge waves of uncontrolled illegal immigration, lived and worked among the poorest of the poor, many of them recent immigrants themselves, some documented, some not. No one fears uncontrolled waves of illegal immigration more than the poorest of the poor, recent immigrants themselves, documented or not, living on or near the U.S. border. It is their homes. It is their neighborhoods. It is their children's schools. It is their jobs that are most put at risk by this. This is wrong. Look, we are a nation of immigrants. We're also a nation of laws. We can be both. I hope and demand that we always will be. And to that end, I tell President Biden, secure the border or shut it down. We're not going to continue to fund your government as if nothing had changed 
when we've got this crisis unfolding, uh, unfolding on monumental proportions. So whether it's all of government or just the White House toilet paper budget, I don't know. But there have to be consequences for him doing this. We hold the power of the purse. We can do that. Somos una nación de inmigrantes. Somos también una nación de leyes. Podemos y debemos ser los dos. Representative Borchardt, I know he has to slip right out. Thank you. Appreciate Thank you all. It's the 435th most powerful member of Congress. I never get to go at the front of the line, but I have a committee meeting I have to get to, and I appreciate the members allowing me to do that in the Senate. Thank you all for your hospitality. Just some simple numbers. I'm a simple guy. Eight million folks. That's basically the population of the great state of Tennessee and over half the states in this country. That's what the Biden administration has admitted that has come over the border in the last three years. 100,000, you've got a soul in your body. 100,000 children are unaccounted for. Who, God knows what horrible life they're either in the sex trade or whatever those godless cartels are doing. Um, the, the amount of money, over $150 billion a year, low end of what it costs to house, to, um, to medicate, to do whatever that we need to do for these, educate these folks. And um, uh, I guess the, the final thing is that we need to remember no border, no budget. That we hold this country's purse strings, and we ought to get some guts and exercise it. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Representative Drew, please step in. Thank you to my friend, Congressman Matt Rosendell from Montana, and Senator Scott for organizing this. You know, of all the crises that this president has created, under which this country is suffering, as we continue to suffer under the Biden, Pelosi, Schumer policies that are in place from a year ago, that are uh, destroying the country, the spending levels that are bankrupting the country, you know, between the energy crisis, between the weakening of our military, what's going on in our education system, uh, the assault on our values and our freedoms, the weaponization of the government against its citizens, so many crises created, I would submit that the greatest immediate threats are our debt, unprecedented level of debt, and the, the open border. Biden's open border. So we've got $2.5 trillion deficit, $200 billion a month, never happened before outside of COVID in this country. $34 trillion of debt on our way to $36 trillion by the next election. 40-year high inflation under which the American people are suffering. The average family is paying about $1,000 a month for the essentials, the basics, and they were paying uh, when this president got into office. We've got interest rates that are further exacerbating that 20-year high. The people are suffering. And do we, as a Republican Party, as a House majority, and our colleagues in the Senate, certainly the people that are with us here today do, do we really care about that? How does it matter, and what are we prepared to do to deal with that? Furthermore, with the border, 10 million illegals invading our country, not allowed by this president, helped by this president. 170 different countries. Uh, a couple million of those being what we call the criminal gotaways, the ones who don't want the free health care, the free social services, the free travel, the free housing, the free education, the ones that are on our plane when we fly back from the border without going through the same checks that we have to go to get on a plane, by the way. No court date to appear. Just go where you want to. We'll get in touch with you later. Literally, that's what it says on their papers. Irreparable harm having been done to the country. A Hamas-like situation, almost a certainty if we close the border today because of who we've led into this country. They acknowledged to us when we were at the border just last week, they don't know where 75% of those, they admit it, they don't know where 75% of the individuals they've let into this country, uh, which is in the range of 8 million, so 6 million they acknowledge, we don't know where they are. They find about 100 dumb ones on the terrorist watch list who come and surrender to Border Patrol like the other 8 million. How many do you think might be dangerous criminals terrorists among the two million who are the gotaways who don't surrender do you think that it might only be 10 percent are dangerous so only 200,000 critically dangerous very dangerous individuals we've let in the country only 200,000 you think it's only 10 percent what if it's only one percent 20,000 I don't think anybody would take that bet took 2,000 to do what Hamas did and look at what we we're allowing every day 300,000 last month record level this president sets records in some things fuel prices inflation Certainly, uh, illegals allowed into the country, not allowed, helped into the country on this president. And so my colleagues and I are here to say, we are prepared to do what's necessary to, to make a difference. The American people elected us to cut our spending, to record, restore fiscal stability to this Congress, to, to save the country, and to secure the border. And we're willing to do whatever it takes. And I yield back, Mr. Rosendale. Thank you very much. Yeah, next to... 
Court, Corey Mills, Representative Corey Mills, Florida. Great state of Florida. The great state of Florida. Well, thanks everyone for being here. I want to also thank my colleagues from the House as well as for the Senate. It's no mistake what the Biden administration is doing to ensure that this lawlessness and criminality continues to occur at our southern border. Whether you're from the great state of Florida, whether you're from the state of Texas, Arizona, or New Mexico, every single state in America is now a border state. You know, I'm not going to say anything which is eye-opening to what my colleagues have spoken about, but I want to put some perspective around this. You know, in 2018, our cartels were averaging around $500 million in revenue a year. Fast forward under the Biden administration to 2021, and we're looking at around $13 billion in revenue. The amount of people who's come across under the Biden administration, if you couple them all together, is the seventh most popular state in America. You had 302,000 who came across just last month. That is the equivalent of packing the MetLife Stadium, one of the largest professional NFL stadiums, three times. That's what we're facing. And if you don't think that this is coupled into our economic failures, you're mistaken. Every single American is facing an increase in medical costs on their insurance, and much of this is a result of the uncompensated medical that is being covered by the hospitals. I'll give you an example of Yuma, Arizona, where on average they had about a three to four million dollar uncompensated medical cost, which is now seeing the average of 34 to 37 million a year. This is the American people being wrongfully and unconstitutionally forced to pay for illegals who are violating our laws. And it's very simple. The House Republicans can continue to talk about the most conservative border bill that has ever passed the House with H.R. 2, Secure the Border Act, which Schumer and the Democrats in the Senate has refused to take up. But even that aside, we should be enforcing the laws that are currently on the books today. We should bring in judges down to the border to ensure that we don't just do the catch and release policies, but we actually go ahead and render judgment and not allow them to be running around in our country. Under President Trump, the Remain in Mexico and Title 42 helped to quell a lot of the things that was going on. And while we can talk about the needs for immigration reform, which is certainly outdated, we have to address the current invasion, which is going on today. In World War II, we had roughly 150,000 who went in on D-Day. Back then, we called that an invasion. Now you've got 302,000 who are coming across just in this month, but we want to call this asylum seekers. We have cartels and gang members, even terrorists, who are coming across our southern border that is posing a national security, a human rights, and a health issue. This crisis is a crisis in leadership, whether it be Secretary Mayorkas, who I feel should not only just resign, but should be impeached for the crimes of treason, but also the Biden administration has continued to allow this to occur. Let me be clear. Judges are needed to process asylum claims. We need to get rid of the catch and release program, and we need to return to President Trump's remain in Mexico and impeach Mayorkas once and for all to send a message of accountability and the fact that we won't stand for lawlessness. With that, I will hand it back over to Rep. Rosendale. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Okay, next up we have Representative Miller, Mary Miller from Illinois. Thank you. Thanks for joining us. The Biden border crisis is the biggest threat to the country's national security since 9-11. I can't even think of a word to describe it when I was down there, catastrophe, ruinous. Um, the foreign nationals from hostile countries are slipping into the interior unnoticed on flights that Biden is forcing taxpayers to pay for. Over Chris Christmas, we witnessed illegal immigrants boarding commercial flights without any form of identification, and the Biden TSA put up a sign saying the line was for non-citizen without a passport. That is a slap in the face to American citizens who must present identification to fly. The entire border catastrophe is a blatant disregard for Americans who are footing the bill for the entire housing and health care needs for more than 8 million illegal aliens Biden has allowed into the country since January of 2021. Um, Illinois actually is a sanctuary state rolling the red carpet out, expanding benefits for illegals. Biden and the Democrats have advertised, facilitated, and incentivized this invasion. Last week, after going down to the border with Speaker Johnson, I stayed an extra day to go visit a Texas ranch. 
their ranch is being destroyed by illegals. They, they, the migrants are coming over by the thousands. The clothing piled up was knee high. Uh, they, their pecan trees have been destroyed and they have found hundreds of bodies this past year on their property. I will not vote to fund the invasion of our country. And I will not vote to fund the government until we shut down and secure the border. We must secure the border or stop funding the Biden government that is orchestrating this invasion. And with that, I yield back to you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Mary. Representative Kiesel from Texas. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you for allowing me a, to be a part of this. I am a freshman. Andy Ogles and Corey Mills behind me are also freshmen. We are here to try to save America. Something is desperately wrong in America, and I know many of you watching at home feel it. Lawless President Biden has allowed thousands of illegal, illegal immigrants, as you've heard. Unless we take a stand, then we, the people, will not survive, will not endure. I want to talk to the American people rather than to the press. We need the energy of the American people to descend on Congress. Not more money, not more laws. And the conservatives here in Washington need your help. This past week, I've been watching the aspiring movement of the German farmers, thousands of German 